Oh, aku mau di atas kan? Apa? Boleh.
Good morning, Good morning ladies and gentlemen. gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom. Om Swastiastu. Namo Buddhaya. Welcome the second International, International Conference on Environment, on Environment Sustainability, Sustainability Issues and Community, and community Development. Development. On behalf of steering committee, let us welcome our distinguished guest. Sensibly Rector of Diponegoro University, Professor Dr. Yos Johan Utama, SHM Room. Sincerely, Dean of Faculty of Engineering di Ponegoro University, Profesor Insinyur Muhammad Agung Wibowo, MM, MSC, PhD. Sincerely, Chairman of INCRI 2020, Dr. Haryono Setiohuboyo, STMT. Whom we also respect our keynote speaker. As well as our distinguished conference participants. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start, let us pray in accordance to our belief. Pray start. It is very fortunate that we can gather around here in Inkit 2020. Inkit 2020 even bring the theme Reason Updates and Challenges, and challenges on, on Environmental Technology, technology Sciences, Education, education and, and Innovation. We are so pleased to have all of you to be our conference participants this morning. I'm Nova Shafa. And I'm Donatri Sukma. We will be the host of the event in this morning. Okay, for the next, let me read out the rundown for today's event. For the first is opening. Second is singing the Indonesian national anthem. And the third is greeting speech. The fourth is photo session. Fifth is keynote speaker the session and Q and A and session. The sixth is break session. And seven is parallel session. The next one is awarding. And the last one is closing. Entering the first event, namely singing the Indonesia Raya song. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to invite you to open camera. Stand up and sing Indonesia Raya, Indonesia Anthem, please.
Please be seated. We are now going to listen to the greeting speech. Please welcome the chairman of INCI 2020 who will deliver the first remarks. To Dr. Harino Sutoboyo, STMT, time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning. The Honorable Rector of Diponegoro University, the Honorable Ordean of Faculty of Engineering, the Honorable Keynote Speakers and Distinguished Delegates, on behalf of the Organizing Committee of INCRI 2020, I would like to welcome to the second International Conference on Environment, Sustainability Issues and Community Development INCRI 2020 held by Environmental Engineering Department, Faculty of Engineering, Diponegoro University. I am delighted to be with you in the conference which provides a unique platform from the professionals, researchers, and the academicians to share their influences and explore the possible influence of sustainable living environment in the future. In this second ingrid, we received more than 100 papers from six countries which we presented via online conference within eight parallel oral sessions. We hope all the presented papers will be published in the International Proceeding Index by Scopus. I would like to thank all the keynote speakers as well as for all the presenters for sharing their valuable experiences to address solutions for the environmental problems, sustainable issues, and community development from various fields and perform multidisciplinary approach to gain sustainability in the context of environmental protections, conservations, and human development as a whole. We believe in this conference, we could contribute to the community by sharing ideas for better living environment. I would like to take the opportunity to give our appreciations to keynote speakers, moderators, reviewers, the authors, and the conference organizers, as well as the Bonacoro UPT support for making the successful of the event of INCRI 2020. Thank you. Have a nice virtual conference. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. All right. Thank you to Mr. Haryono Setiohuboyo for the speech. And the second speech will be delivered by the Dean of Faculty of Engineering, Diponegoro University, to Professor Insinyur Muhammad Agung Wibowo, MM, MSJ, PhD. Please welcome. Yes. Thank you, Dona. The Honorable Rector, the Honorable Head of the Department, the Distinguished the Chairman, the Committee, the English keynote speakers, participants, and also for the students. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Professor Muhammad Agnifo, PhD, the Dean of Faculty Engineering of Universitas Diponegoro. It is such a good pleasure for me to welcoming all of the participants for the second international conference on environment, sustainability issue, and the community development 2020. I'm pleased to welcome all the participants to join this event. I do really appreciate for all the participants to join this international conference pay online due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to extend my warm welcome 
to all the keynote speakers. They are Professor Toru Matsumoto, the University of Kita, Japan. Professor Dr. Amarianto, Gunabaro University. Dr. Swipe Temiyaga, Makarere University, Uganda. Mario Rosario Guarasino, National Research of Italy, Italy. And Dr. Mai Syed Paul Abdul Aziz, Foyum University, Egypt, for agreeing to share the knowledge on the sustainability issue and community development topics, and it really means to us. I hope this cooperation in the International Forum for the researchers, students, industry, and government in communicating the research and development results on the fundamental and application of the environment, sustainable issue, and community development. I do hope this event could facilitate the formation and to strengthen our network among participants of the conference for improving the quality of research for the benefit for us. Finally, I would like to thank for your cooperation and have a great time to join this international conference. Undip Jaya. Thank you very much. Thank you, Donna. Thank you to Mr. Agung for the speech. The third remarks will be given by the rector of the Ponegoro City to Professor Dr. Yos Johan Utama, SIM Home. Time is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Best wishes of all, to all of us. Peace be of upon you, and may Allah mercy and bless you. Dear Dean of the Faculty of Engineering di Ponegoro New City, and his staff, the Honorable Head of the Department, and the entire academic community and environmental engineering di Ponegoro City, and also all the presenters and participants will live up the increased effort until this day. It is my honor to be able to give or speak at the increased effort. This conference is a forum for in in exchanging perspective and information related to environmental sustainability and sustainable development, which our present has become one of the most challenging topics it discuss in this international arena. This conference can open our horizon, horizon related to research or ideas that have a positive impact on our environment. We must come to be the common understanding of the environmental challenges we face and determine how overcoming these challenges can help us to keep the environmental sustainable. I would like to welcome and thank all of the speakers and who are willing to fill in the INCRIT 2020 event. I hope that what is a confi here and can answer all of the, our questions in our minds and open our knowledge about technology to solve environmental problems. I also welcome all in CRIT 2020 participants that today will present their ideas and knowledge related to environmental technology, science, education, and innovation to achieve sustainable development goals. 
I look forward to all of your ideas regarding the environmental problems that we are facing. I would like to thank the, of the, to the Department of Environmental Engineering for organizing this extraordinary event to support the effort to conserve our Earth and our sustainable development goals. Once again, welcome to INCRIT 2020. I hope this event will run smoothly and bring many benefits for all of us. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you to Professor Dr. Yos Johan Utama, SH at home. Okay. Ponegoro University has been moving ahead to be the best university in Indonesia by providing 13 faculties of undergraduate and postgraduate. Diponegoro University has graduated 300,000 qualified alumnus. Diponegoro University also establishes vocational schools to generate a ready-to-work alumnus. Holding the fighting values of Pangaran Diponegoro such as honest, brave, fair and attentive, Diponegoro University keeps producing excellent alumnus nationally and internationally while also contributing in the development of knowledge, technology, art, culture and exercise. continuously improving the supporting aspect such as regulation, facilities, financial system, bureaucracy management, information system, as well as quality of human resources, quality escalation of three Dharma Pertuan is the primary target of UNIP by stimulating the downstream of recent outcomes that can be beneficially implemented for the society. We are also keen to improve the quantity of national and international academic publication, as well as the number of doctorates and professors in Diponegoro University. Now, Diponegoro University has been improving in two important aspects of achievement institutionally and student achievement. Diponegoro University has become a world-class university by being ranked fifth amongst almost 5,000 universities in Indonesia. Meanwhile, the students' achievement in both national and international scales of prestigious events are increasing. vision to be an imminent research university is supported by the continued increase of research funding. 
The total research and civil service funding in 2018 is 123.7 billion rupiah. It consists of PNBP, the National Competition Research Funding, and Collaboration Research Funding. The intellectual property right becomes the indicator of significantly improved research. The patent consists of simple patent, patent, international patent, software and invention legal letter. To support the academic process, Diponagora University has been improving the student facilities. Thus, the students will not only get the knowledge but also the actualization space. central computerized system that includes the service for the online study plan and online registration. Siswa pertama yang diterima itu angkatan 1999. Saat ini sudah hampir 1000 alumni yang dihasilkan menjadi teknik lingkungan yang profesional. Hal yang perlu saya tandaskan di dalam pengembangan Departemen Teknik Lingkungan, orientasi terhadap lapangan itu sekarang tuntutannya harus dilengkapi dengan inovasi. Nah, oleh karena itu, tanggung jawab pengembangan inovasi di dalam konteks pengelolaan lingkungan bukan hanya tanggung jawab dari uh, departemen, dalam hal ini dosen dan teknik uh, tenaga kependidikan, namun juga tanggung jawab bersama uh, para mahasiswa uh, dan alumni sehingga diharapkan alumni dan uh, mahasiswa memberikan kontribusi yang utuh 
terhadap pengembangan daripada Departemen Teknik Lingkungan ini sehingga ke depan bisa mengisi semua aspek di dalam uh, yang berkaitan dengan pengelolaan lingkungan sehingga lini-lini pekerjaan yang mampu bisa memberikan kontribusi terhadap pengembangan keilmuan teknik lingkungan uh, bisa kita raih. Program Magister Teknik Lingkungan Universitas Diponegoro menyelenggarakan program pendidikan untuk menyiapkan tenaga ahli teknik lingkungan yang siap berkontribusi nyata dalam praktek di bidang teknologi pengendalian pencemaran lingkungan dan infrastruktur lingkungan seperti air minum, pengelolaan limbah, kualitas udara, dan remediasi lokasi yang terkontaminasi serta pemulihan sumber daya. Program ini juga menyiapkan lulusan yang memiliki latar belakang yang kuat di bidang teknik lingkungan melalui kurikulum dan metode pembelajaran yang memungkinkan mahasiswa bekerja dan belajar serta berdampingan dengan para tenaga pengajar dan para peneliti yang akan membimbing dan mengawasi penelitian mereka. Program ini juga memberikan kesempatan kepada para mahasiswa untuk berkembang secara individu melalui program interaksi dengan masyarakat profesional, kegiatan seminar, dan forum ilmiah. Saat ini teknik lingkungan sudah terakreditasi A dan sudah terakreditasi internasional IAPI Karena itu teknik lingkungan selalu bertekad untuk menghasilkan lulusan yang profesional Dan mampu berkecimpung di dalam berbagai hal untuk mengatasi berbagai isu lingkungan yang ada Dan menjadi solusi untuk masa depan Luna, we have we've already seen the company profile of the Panorama City as well as the Environmental Engineering Department. Okay, now the third event is photo session and for all, all participants, please turn on the camera because we will picture this moment and also please give your the best smile for today, alright? Okay, while waiting for all participants to turn off the camera, we're going to um, start counting if all, all participants already turn on the camera. We're going to start counting from one, one two, two, and three. Cheese. cheese. Wait until five seconds. Okay, I think all participants already been captured. Now we're moving on to the next sessions. Ladies and gentlemen, we are off to the first material sessions. In this session, we will have two keynote speakers. The first one is Professor Dr. Insinyur Ambarianto, MSJ from Indonesia. And the second one is Professor Matsumoto from Japan. And this session will be guided by Mr. Ika Bagus Priyambada, STM Eng. Before that, let us read the moderator CV. Mr. Ika Bagus Priyambada, STM Eng, currently is a lecturer in the Department of Environmental Engineering di Penegoro University. And for background education, the first one is Bachelor of Engineering in Civil Engineering. Faculty of Engineering di Ponegoro University, and the second is Master of Engineering in Environmental Engineering at Griffith University, Australia, and the third is Doctor of Philosophy in Environmental Science at the Ponegoro University. Mr. Ika is also a researcher at Pusat Penelitian Lingkungan Hidup at LP LPPM Undip Semarang, also a member of Ikatan Ahli Teknik Penyihatan Indonesia, also certified as AMDAL and ISO auditor for from national institution and participate in number of consultancy projects including but not limited to design of water supply systems landfill detail engineering design AMDAL studies for several construction projects such as hospital industry apartment housing facilities and many more all right please welcome our moderator Mr Ika Bagus Priyambada STM please welcome
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As we are about to begin, please be seated and be comfortable. We kindly ask for your attention since we have some notes to make before we begin the first keynote speaker session. Please kindly mute your microphone and camera uh, and on camera when keynote speaker session to ensure, to ensure that this event runs smoothly. Thank you for, for your kind attention and cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, before well, welcome to the first keynote speaker session of the second international conference of Inter uh, environmental sustainability issues and community development in Crete 2020. My name is Ika Bagus Priambada as moderator for this first parallel session. Today's program is reflected on your program books but we will defer, uh, deliver more details. First, operating parallel session by moderator. And second, oral presentation from each keynote speaker led by moderator. And third, discussion after keynote speaker one and two presenting. And the last is giving a certificate to keynote speaker. The session will continue by presentation from keynote speaker Oral presentation for all, from uh, each keynote speaker conduct for 30 minutes, uh, 30 minutes of presentation and 30 minutes for question and answer. Question and answer can be delivered directly by clicking uh, the raise hand button or indirectly through the meeting chat. Ladies and gentlemen, continue to the next schedule. We would like to invite uh, Professor Ambarianto from Marine Science Department, Diponegoro University, as our first keynote speaker today, bringing the topic on the role of marine and uh, the role of marines uh, on environmental sustainable development goals. Please wel welcome Prof. Uh, Professor Ambarianto. The time is yours. Thank you, Mr. Uh, firstly, I would like to congratulate to the Faculty of Engineering on the University for successfully conducting the, uh, the second event of this international seminar. Also for the fellow presenter, as well as uh, all the participants of the international seminars. Please let me share my presentation. Can you see in this my presentation? Yes, Prof. It's clear. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, Prof. It's clear. You can see? Yes. Yeah. Clear, clear, sir. Yes, clear enough. Okay. And uh, it was mentioned by the moderator that the title of my presentation is going to be in the role of marine environment on sustainable development goals. And this is going to be my presentation outline, introduction, sustainable development goals, and then SDGs related to marine environments and conclusion. Uh, as we know that, uh, Ocean cover more than 70% of the earth surface. So it's not, it's supposed to be called ocean rather than the earth because more ocean rather than the earth. Uh, and it affects the world climate and weather. It also affects the lives of hundreds of millions of people and providing so many services for human life. Uh, and any significant changes will have a tremendous impact, both can be negatively or positively. And it, when you see this picture, our bird ocean actually provide uh, the air for uh, our life and also climate regulation. It also provide transportation Recreation, actually recreation is both above water and also in the water, diving, snorkeling, and so on. Economics, 
and it will also provide food and also medicine. Uh, for Indonesian marine resources, uh, I'm not trying to give all the information, just for an example. Uh, the potential of fish sustainability is 12.4.54 million tons fish per year. And we have approximately 25,000 kilometers square of coral reefs. 3.56 million hectares of mangroves, 293.4 hectares of seagrass, approximately 4,720 species of face, 2,500 species of smallest, 2,000 species of crustacean, and also 30 species of marine mammals and so many other resources that actually uh, we have in Indonesia. In regard to sustainable development goals, as we know, it was initiated by the UN and it was started at the beginning of 2016 and hopefully will be achieved all the goals by 2030. It has been ratified by 193 countries and there are 17 goals and 169 targets. And if we look at the goals and the targets, all cover almost all aspects of human life. And for your information, it is a continuation of Millennium Development Goals, which was ended in 2015. This is showing you these all 17 goals of SDGs and with the blue color, uh, those are actually closely related to marine environment and resources. The first one is goal number one, no poverty. The second one, goal number two, zero hunger. The third one, good health and well-being. The fourth one is the number 13, climate action. And the most, the close one, the goal number 14, life before a below water. For the first uh, goal, no poverty, goal number one, actually the value of marine environment resources can reduce poverty. We can see that marine environment and resources has values, including from food, for example, what we eat every day, shrimp, fish, clams, etc. Marine tourism, both above and below water, marine mining, marine biotechnology, marine transportation, etc. Those are, have uh, big value that can help to reduce poverty of the community. When we look at the target of the goal number one, for example, 1.4, I highlighted by blue color by 2030, there should be equal rights to economic resources, natural resources, this is including uh, marine resources. In the number 1.5 by 2030, it should be reduced their exposure and vulnerability to climate-related extreme events and also environment shocks and disaster. As I mentioned before, the marine environment can uh, affect the uh, climate and also weather. So. It really depends on us how to manage our marine environment and resources. For 1.A, ensure significant mobilization of resources from a variety of sources. I think this is uh, including marine resources. When you see this picture, it shows that the global marine biotechnology market is forecasted to grow up to 5.9 billion by 2022. 
and marine ecosystem estimated to contribute 2.5 trillion dollars and most importantly each dollar invested in marine protected areas yields a return of around 20 dollars in benefit so you can imagine how important is uh, to establish marine protected areas uh, to actually uh, sustain the uh, marine resources. With these values, marine resources can help reducing poverty. It actually really depends on how we uh, manage the marine environment and also marine resources. And also, it has been mentioned before, the equal rights to marine resources to everyone. So, like what in SDG's motto, no one left. Behind. For goals number two, zero hunger. Marine environment is one of the global uh, resource of food. Global fish production in 2010 amounted 148.1 million metric tons. And in 2019, last year, it's going up to 177.8 million metric tons. So increase approximately 20%. The estimated average per capita consumption of fish worldwide in 2019, so last year, it was about 20.9 kilograms. So this is uh, estimated average per capita per year consumption of fish. And uh, the lack of production from the ocean, from marine production, it is obtained from aquaculture activities. When we look at the target of the second goals on 2.1 by 2030, end of hunger and ensure access by all people. So, we have to ensure that uh, all people can access to marine resources. Number 2.3, by 2030, double the agricultural productivity and incomes of small-scale food producer, including for fishermen. This picture show you on the left global capture production and global aquaculture production. In the blue color, is, it is an aquaculture production and the uh, reddish, green, yellowish color, it's capture production from uh, marine resources. So you see that mostly from marine, but the production from aquaculture is increasing. The picture on the, the right only show you a more similar picture, but on the bottom, it shows you that all the fish capture, not all for food, but also for feed and other non-food uses. When we are talking about work, Fish consumption on the left, it shows you it's increasing quite significantly. But when we are talking about special Indonesia, the consumption of uh, people of Indonesia on fish, it's also increasing. But when we compare with other countries, Indonesia is still 41 on the 2015. This is approximately 41 kilogram per capita per year. At the same year, uh, Malaysia already 70 kilograms per capita per year, and Singapore already 80 kilograms, and Japan 100 kilograms. Last year, it was approximately uh, targeted up to 54.4 kilogram per capita per year in Indonesia. It's still uh, below 
our neighbor countries like Malaysia, Singapore, and also Japan. So there is a need for us to have a much bigger effort uh, to uh, to uh, ask people to consume fish, especially Indonesian uh, community, Indonesian people. Now, upon the goals number three, good health and well-being, ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. So marine organisms have been known to be important sources for development of drugs and cosmetics. It comes from sponges, corals, soft corals, marine bacteria, marine snails, etc. It is actually based on bioactive compound found on those marine organisms. And the target of uh, goal number three on 3.9, by 2030, substantially reduce the number of death and illness from hazardous chemicals and air, water and soil pollution and contamination. So this is including marine uh, pollution and contamination. We have to reduce it significantly. And number three point B, support the research and development of vaccine, vaccines and medicines. As I have mentioned before that marine uh, resources is the source of uh, drugs and cosmetics. This is only show you marine drugs from the sea. I will not read all of those, but there are so many lists of the drugs from the sea and also bioactive compounds from the sea. Many research groups doing similar thing around the world. So this is only a small part of uh, their findings. This is also uh, the same information marine drugs from the sea. This is to show, show you an example of cosmetic from the sea. Actually, this is only an example, but so many others has been, have been produced. Uh, apart from drugs and cosmetic, and we know that uh, nutrition content of face the face is contains so many nutrition value like vitamin A, omega-3, vitamin D, vitamin B12, zinc, calcium, iron, iodine, selenium, and also in very important the protein from the sea, from marine organisms. Another example, for example, for salmon, it uh, contains for per four ounce of salmon, it contains only 5.5 gram of fat, but 31.7 gram of proteins. For the uh, climate action goals, we have to take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. As I have been mentioned, that ocean has important influence on climate change. As you might be heard, increasing seawater surface temperature and also sea level rise has caused water inundation in many parts of the world, including in Indonesia, actually including in north part of Samara. And it has also caused marine related hazards such as tsunami, for example. On the target of the goals number 13, 13.1, 13 for example, strengthen resilience and adaptive capacity to climate-related hazard. This is, we are talking about uh, related also to natural uh, marine uh, hazard where we need to improve the resilience and adaptive capacity for community who lives in the coastal area. Integrate climate change 
improve education about the climate change mitigation, adaptation, and impact reduction, and also early warning system. And also promote mechanism of raising capacity for effective climate change related planning and management. This is very important for uh, uh, what is it, uh, for the government, uh, for the policy makers, for example. This picture show you the increasing sea surface temperature. It's increased steadily, but keep increasing and also sea level rise. In fact, in Semarang, sea level rise is approximately uh, uh, two centimeter per year or something. This is show you uh, the, the effect of sea level rise water inundation to those who live in coastal area. Uh, you can see many of this kind of pictures in the north part of Samara. For adaptation strategy uh, for a coastal community, it can be done by three different methods. The first one is retreat. So move from the close to the beach to the further up. And the second one, the accommodation. So the the third one is uh, protection, both hard and soft. This picture is an example of soft protection of the coastal area, for example, rehabilitation and replantation of corals, mangrove, and sea grasses. For hard protection, it can be done by seawall, or maybe you put tetrapods on the beach, to protect abrasion, or maybe groins like the picture on the below left. And the last goals related to marine uh, environment and resources is life below water, goal number 14. Conserve sustainable use of ocean and seas and marine resources for sustainable development. As you might know that ocean has the highest biodiversity in the world, for example, in Coral Triangle, where six countries involved, including Indonesia. Indonesia was the initiator of the Coral Triangle. In general, many resources have been managed poorly in general. Many anthropogenic activities negatively affect marine resources. For example, maybe you know that uh, plastic pollution is Indonesia is number two in the world after China in the ocean. Marine pollution, uh, for example, oil spill, dumping waste in the sea, microplastic, etc., have reduced marine resources significantly. Overfishing around the world, including Indonesia, also happening. Degradation of many important marine ecosystems, such as coral reefs, mangrove forests, seagrass beds, etc., and also climate change related, increasing temperature, seawater surface temperature, and also sea level rise, as I have been mentioned before. When you look at this uh, picture, overfishing, you can see on the left hand side. Global fish production by tons. This is farm, aquaculture, and also capture. And the on the ID above is upper face, full day face, and also under face. So when you will look at the picture, those who it which fully and upper face is much more higher and than under face. When you look at the picture on the right hand side, fully exploited already 52%, offer exploited 17%, and also depleted was already 7%, moderately exploited 20%. 
and under exploited 3%. So the number of the marine resource which is under exploited is getting smaller. Now, when we look at the budget of uh, goals number 14, like below water, uh, 4.1, for example, by 2025, we, sh we should be able to significantly reduce marine pollution at all kinds. By 2020, this year, sustainably manage and protect marine and coastal ecosystem. Minimize and address the impact of ocean acidification. This is one of the important marine uh, problems that we face right now, uh, ocean acidification. By 2020, conserve at least 10% of uh, marine areas. I think Indonesia has more than 10% right now. So it has uh, same as what uh, SDGs targeted, more than 10% actually. By 2030, increase the economic benefit of small island developing states and least developed countries from sustainable use of marine resources. And for point B, provide access for small-scale artisanal fishers to many resources and markets. This is an, an example how we should do, for example, marine uh, pit screening to reduce marine pollution and also marine parks, like in Indonesia, they have, we have many marine parks. For example, the Falkatobi National Park and also Bunaken. And close to Semarang, there is Karimun Jawa Marine National Park as well. So in conclusion, marine environment and resources have important roles and parts in achieving sustainable development goals, at least related to goals number 1, 2, 3, 13, and 14. Implementing integrated coastal, ocean zone, and small islands management is very important properly. And the most important is that we should get involved on those related programs and activities to support the achievement of the goals. I think that's all I can uh, present today. Thank you very much. Uh, but I'm sorry that I will not be able to stay longer in this uh, webinar because I have another agenda, another webinar actually, become a, also a presenter. So if there is any question, please tell to the committee and they will let me know. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much to Professor Ambarianto for the presentation. As mentioned by Professor Ambarianto, all participants who want to uh, give a question for Prof. Ambarianto may uh, contact the committee. And then uh, the committee will let Professor Ambarianto know and uh, hopefully will answer uh, the question that uh, given by all participants. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we come to a second spe uh, second keynote speaker of today, who is Professor Matsumoto from University of Kitakyushu, Japan. And Professor Matsumoto will bring in the topic of Society 5.0 and Solid Waste Management. I think the topic is very interesting for us in Indonesia because solid waste management is still become a major problem, becoming environmental issue in Indonesia. So uh, we let Professor Matsumoto from University of Kitakyushu, Japan, to uh, deliver the presentation. Please, Professor, the time is yours. <coughs> Yes, thank you, Chairman. 
I'm Toru Matsumoto from the University of Kyushu, Japan. Is it okay? Yes, it's okay. <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> Again, I'm Toru Matsumoto from the University of Takyushu, Japan. Thank you for inviting me to this conference. I'm very honored to have a chance to introduce my research. Today, I will talk about Society 5.0 and solid waste management. Society 5.0 is defined that a human-centered society that balances economic achievement with the resolution of social problems by a system that highly integrates cyberspace and physical space and was proposed by the Japanese government in 2016. It follows the hunting society agricultural society, industrial society, and information society. <clears throat> New technologies such as IoT, robotics, AI, and big data, all of which can affect the course of society, are continuing to progress. Society 5.0 is the concept for realization, a new society that incorporates these new technologies in all industries and social activities and achieves both economic development and solutions to social problems in parallel. IoT and AI can achieve more efficient waste management. For example, minimize the time and cost of labor for waste collection and treatment, and maximize the natural resource substitution by increasing the possibility of supply and demand matching. <clears throat> From 2019, new project named Feasibility and Effectiveness Analysis of ICT for River Supply Chain Management was started. It is founded by Ministry of the Environment of Japanese government, and I am a leader of this project. There are, are these uh, the purposes of our project <laughs> to achieve the optimal management of the industrial waste generation and the whole process that supposed to be uh, positioned as reverse supply management, including the section processing and the utilization, the potential for introducing the corresponding applicable ICT and AI will be investigated and explored. Then the effectiveness of developing and introducing such kind of assumed system that contained specific introducing stages will be evaluated from the environmental, economic and safety aspects. And second purpose is evaluating the effectiveness of ICT and AI techniques for optimizing the, the management through the diverse supply chain.
there are the these are the outline of our project. Sub theme one. Promoting the resource circulation efficiency and appropriate disposal through the realization interaction between discharging and disposing details. Sub theme one. <clears throat> Sub theme two. Sub theme two. Optimizing the matching between supply and demand and the inspection of the upgrading waste to energy. And sub theme three, upgrading of the maintenance and management of the facilities based on the utilization of ICT and AI to achieve the thermal recovery processing. And last part, sub theme four, Upgrade the safety management and increase the productivity and promote the appropriate disposal by applying ICT. <clears throat> four, mainly four research institutions, including this project, such as University of Kyushu and University of Wakayama, uh, Waseda University and Ritsumeikan University and National Institute of Environment of Japan. <clears throat> Our research goals of sub theme one are as following two. First one is evaluation of the effect, effect of realization interaction between emission and processing companies by utilizing ICT and AI by comparing the cost and environmental load required for system construction with the cost and environmental load that can be reduced. <clears throat> Second goal is developing of a prototype of a multi-purpose information management system that can be applied to various waste and recycling systems centering on a traceability system using work chain management that utilize QR code and smartphones. <clears throat> We clarified the compatibility of sensors with waste characteristics and the measurement environment. As shown in this table, three types of nine sensor products, eight physical properties of waste, and three conditions such as solar radiation, humidity, and fog were investigated. It has found that in flared triangulation sensors are not suitable for distance measurement at a waste disposal site because there are many object, objects for which they cannot measure the distance. And the distance measurement system is frequently not suitable depending on the on the angle of the object object based on this result it is appropriate to determine actual introduction by carefully examining the relationship between price and durability to improve the efficiency by waste collection we developed and demonstrated a system for providing user with real-time information on the accumulation status of waste in remote location online. The IoT, IoT sensor was installed in the upper part of the device, device and it was confirmed that 
measurement data could be visualized, visualized in real time. Uh, this is the figure of eye trying of our system. And this figure is the result of the IoT sensor. Assuming that this system is applied at the site of implementation, we calculate, calculated the optimal solution to the problem of optimizing the dispatched de uh, delivery of multi vehicles using the actual data of an industrial waste collection and trans transportation company. In order to meet actual needs, it is necessary to calculate the optimization of timing in addition to the vehicle dispatched and delivery remote using a, a, a current general purpose PC. But the development of new algorithm was found to be necessary. The traceability system by activity record management that we are trying to develop in this project is a system that realizes the integration of things and information as defined by IoT. The information scanned by a QR code can be directly recorded in a cloud server during each task in real time and necessary information from this recorded information can be output as a voucher. Further, the system has the following advantages. Input can be performed by a simple task. The load on the worker is small and the work data is automatically recorded to prevent tampering. tampering. <laughs> While further promotion of low carbon measured and effective use of resources is required, it is necessary to improve the efficiency of energy recovery from waste and usable for recycling. <clears throat> Supply of steam to manufacturing plants is effective for further efficiency improvements. A stable supply to a stable supply of steam is important for the stable operation of manufacturing plants. According to interview with disposal operator, industrial waste uh, industrial waste has different characteristics depending on the waste generator. Therefore, the establishment of a platform for sharing information on how much waste will be generated at what time for each waste generator will enable, enable the, the estimation of the calorific value that can be input into the furnace over time and the systematic mixing of waste with different compositions in order to sta stabilize the caloric value. Incinerate, stab stably, uh, incinerate, incinerate uh, stably and continuously supply steam. In general, incinerators can store waste for one to two weeks. So the information sharing platform is considered not to need frequent update of information 
in near real time, but rather updates of one to several times a day to be currently sufficient. In that case, it would be desirable for the for the incineration facility and manufacturing plant to closely share supply and demand information, including predicted value and coordinate with other facilities in the area. In the case of excessive supply, such as by diversion to other purposes. <clears throat> In detection of incinerations of abnormally normal case are uh, accumulated and signs of abnormally are detected based on accumulated cases, but indication detection based on continuously accumulated cases becomes inefficient over time. In this case, we developed an algorithm, uh, algorithm to accelerate regression calculations while maintaining, uh, maintaining accuracy by dynamically narrowing the set of cases from the learning of normal value data based on Gaussian process regression, which is a nonlinear regression model and built a prototype of monitoring system for detecting indications of anomaly. Using, using a commercially available sensor, we constructed a prototype of general purpose measurement system that can stable acquire sampling rate at a higher frequency of 500 kilohertz, which is equip, equivalent to 10 times the normal rate and stored the processing program in a commercially available USB memory for operation on a general notebook PC. This was applied to the fan of the rotary kiln furnace, which is the most common incinerator for industrial waste, and its effectiveness was evaluated. It is important, I'm sorry, it is possible to meet cost constraints while maintaining the status and performing more advanced maintenance, such as predictive maintenance. In an industrial waste incinerator with many development funnels, this can contribute to a reduction in life cycle costs by reducing workload due to sudden stops, avoiding operation loss, and extend, uh, existing, extending the life of equipment. This is from sub theme four. We investigated work. We investigated work efficiency improvements in the paper manifest input work, which was considered to be burdensome. From among the office work performed by an industrial waste disposal company, we measured how much the manifest input and confirming time changed before and after introduction when input data was created in advance and robotic process automation, RPA software was introduced to 
automate the work of transcri uh, transcribing it to backend software. Input data create time, which is expected to be cost effective, has not reached 40 seconds per case yet, up to now. We conducted a verification test targeting workers at industrial waste treatment facilities with the measurement system to understanding the danger of heat stroke and the actual labor intensity. As a result, some cases were confirmed in which heart rate exceeded the criteria for determining risk of heat stroke. And where the labor intensity was judged to be danger, to be dangerous. <laughs> In addition, older workers tended to be more at risk. By confirming the risk of heat stroke using heart rate and work intensity, it is possible for third person to issue alerts and warnings based on individual physical differences and improve safety management in the waste treatment facility. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for Professor Matsumoto from University of Kita Kyushu, Japan, from uh, the presentations. Uh, it's it's very really interesting uh, because uh, Professor Matsumoto delivering a presentation about uh, Society 5.0 and how to manage the solid waste management because we just familiar with 4.0 professor in Indonesia but now you are uh, delivering to us the concept of 4.0 it's a uh, really new one from uh, for us so uh, after all keynote speaker from professor Ambarianto and professor Matsumoto have presented their respective articles. Therefore, we approach to the end of the first session. And this is, uh, we will have to question and answer session with duration about 30 minutes. And how to we deliver the question and answer uh, by directly, by clicking, uh, clicking the raise hand button. And I will pointing for several participation and selected particip uh, participation. And please, uh, for selected uh, participating, will on camera and microphone. And uh, we have already two participate uh, participate and that uh, will give a question. Uh, the first one is Miss Putri Elma Octavia. Please, Ms. Putri Elma Octavia, may you uh, on camera and on microphone and give your uh, question both to Mr. Uh, Professor Ambarianto and Professor uh, Matsumoto. But uh, as I mentioned before, that Professor Ambarianto is no longer with us now, so you uh, may give a question for Professor uh, Matsumoto. Please, for Miss Putri Elma Octavia, you may give Thank a you. question. Thank you, uh, Aika, for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Putri Elma Octavia. Thank you for your explanation, Mr. Matsumoto. It is an interesting to note that the use of IoT AI and ICT in the waste management system in Japan uh, can appropriately implement it. In other hand, 
Indonesia facing more complicated problems uh, since all of the IoT and AI system cannot work well. In your opinion, um, what kind of challenges that we will face when we try uh, to implement such system in the developing country? Thank you. Sorry, Miss uh, Professor Amber, uh, Professor Matsumoto, can you catch the question? Can you... Sorry, I can't. I can't hear your question clearly. Miss Putri Elma, would you please repeat it once more, maybe uh, more slowly? I will try to write down your question and. My, I repeat my question. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, please. If you don't mind, you may repeat your question once more. Slowly, please. I think your question is about uh, implementing ICT, IoT, and AI. It's right. Regarding to Indonesia as developing country. Is this correct? Yep. Okay. Professor, I think uh, the question from uh, Ms. Putri Elma Octavia is how to implement uh, ICT as your presentation and then IoT and then uh, AI to, uh, to Indonesia, for example, as uh, developing countries where uh, the technology is not, uh, not so dominant as, as at Japan, for example. So how we cope uh, how do we adjust this technology? How do we adjust uh, the, the practice like your presentation to developing country like Indonesia? It is, it is, is that correct, Ms. Putri? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's the question, Ms. Rika. Okay, thank you. Okay, Professor, may, you, you, you may answer the question. Yes, thank you for your question. Uh, I think the cost effective is important. So in our project, we are investi investigate the cost effective. If the comparing the Comparing the I uh, introducing ICT system, comparing between ICT system and the strengthening the governance system based on local government and natural government. If the mm, ICT system has advantage in the aspect of cost effective than the strengthen the based on local government or uh, administer, uh, administrative systems i think the there are some uh, possibility to introducing introduce the ict system i understand the this kind, this system, uh, this kind of system, is uh, has uh, this kind of system needs the high uh, internet and Wi-Fi and cloud system are needed, but the. Uh, Again, the cost effective is important indicators so that we are now investing, investigating and studied about the aspect of cost, cost effective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Matsumoto. Uh, Ms. Putri, is that uh, answered your question? Already answered your question? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Masafoto, for the question. Uh, you answer my questions. Okay, thank you, Ms. Putri. So the second question is from Ms. Nadia Paramita. Uh, please, you can directly deliver your question to Professor Matsumoto by clicking 
uh, by on your uh, your camera and your mic. Hello, good morning, Professor Matsumoto. Thank you for your uh, very presentation. I have two questions. Uh, could you give us a brief overview of the reverse supply chain on domestic waste, waste management system in Japan and how it can be implemented in the Society 5.0? Maybe that's my simple question, please, uh, the answer. Thank you. So the question from uh, Ms. Nadia Paramita is, could you give us a brief overview of reverse supply chains on domestic waste management system in Japan uh. and how it can be implemented in society uh, 5.0, Professor? Uh. Uh, as I guess, uh, I'm sorry. I guess some person here have, have here. Uh, I guess some person have heard the word of three R. Three R means reduce, reuse, and recycling. In Japan, from 2000, the Three R policies introduced to whole environmental policies, and during two decades, three R policies have already mm, uh, <coughs> delivered and uh, introduced to national uh, policies in national level and uh, local level and also uh, uh, private sector and lifestyle our lifestyle but as you may know the eu adopted new policy named ce circular economy circular economy has more wide concept. In, in recent year, uh, Japanese government and Japanese uh, industrial sector uh, uh, investi investigating and studying CE policy circular economy policy and want to catch up the CE, circular economy policy. So <clears throat> in So the uh, Society 5.0 and uh, ICT technologies for uh, river supply chain management, it's just starting point for us, for Japanese government and, and Japanese industrial sectors and also uh, academic uh, society. So. Again, just starting point. It's my uh, recognition. Thank you. For, thank you for your question. Thank you, Professor Matsumoto. For Ms. Nadia, is that answer your question? Thank you, Professor, for the answer. Okay, thank you, Ms. Nadia. Uh, we're still waiting uh, on the third question from participant, but. Uh, Right now is still uh, no question emerge. So before, uh, uh, while we are waiting for the question from participant, maybe I will 
ask you a question for Matsumoto. Uh, as we know that uh, there is a shifting shifting period between 4.0 and 5.0, where 5.0 is more more to adjusting the society. That 4.0 is more technological. I think regarding to solid waste management, especially in Indonesia, that uh, society has become become very important because we have not yet implementing management of solid waste using technology such as 4.0, for example, for example, using ICT, IOT, the Internet of Thing, or artificial engineering. So that uh, maybe we can start from. Is it possible if we can start it from 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 5.0 first, and then and then 4.0 is is become a second factors that we uh, adjust later. Do you think it is it possible, Professor? Because it's Indonesia, I think it's using IoT and then ICT. AI, especially for solid waste management, is is still is still far beyond. So, uh, but we have a culture that that uh, 5.0 approach is more suitable for us. Is it possible if if we delivered 5.0 first and then and then try to to adjusting with 4.0 concept? For your opinion, professor. Thank you. Uh. Mm. I have uh, I have visited Indonesia many times and I have saw the uh, present situation of waste management in Indonesia. For example, the Visualization from generation point to um, treatment or final disposal point. <clears throat> By using ICT technology, it's easy to um, visualize. So, if the <clears throat> we if we when we um, conscious the cost effective and technology feasibility of ICT technology, I think it, uh, it has, we have some possibility to uh, introduce ICT technology for supply chain, reverse supply chain management. <laughs> it's the I'm sorry, it's the same uh, answer for the previous okay. question. <laughs> it's my recognition. Okay, so so the ICT is still very important factors, right, Professor? I see technology is still a uh, very important <coughs> factors that we have to implement first, especially for solid waste management. Okay, thank you for your answer, Professor Matsumoto. Uh, please, participant, if you have still any question for Professor Matsumoto, don't hesitate to raise your hand. And maybe you can, uh, maybe not only question, maybe you can share any experience or any opinions that you may uh, deliver to Professor Matsumoto, who have very much experience in managing solid waste using 4.0 approach. Okay, this is a question, another question, Professor, from uh, the committee. <laughs> 
Uh, what is the most important to note, society consciousness or, or ICT improvement? So, which one is more important between society consciousness or ICT improvement? Because we realize that ICT improvement is, is, is require more infrastructure, for example, like you mentioned, uh, we need a uh, Wi-Fi internet that uh, has a uh, very high quality, but uh, we 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 still cannot provide such of thing in every every <laughs> every region in Indonesia. So, which one is important for us? For for what what your opinion? Uh, society consciousness or uh, ICT improvement? This is a question from committee, not from me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yes. Uh, ICT and internet environment is important. And also the understanding, understanding of existing industrial sector and national and local government are also important. In Japan, we, I am a member of the association of introducing IoT and AI technology to waste management. And we are, uh, during two or three years, we are discussing about the possibility of in introducing this kind of technology to existing uh, waste management system. In that case, the, <clears throat> there are many existing um, industrial sectors and waste treatment companies in Japan. So um, some, um, some companies can we will some com some companies will be able to catch up to new system but some small companies cannot will not be able to catch up to new system but um, if the national level of government and Industrial Association can understand the new uh, the effective of effective to if cost and effective of to environment aspect. Uh, it's uh, use uh, it's useful and it's effective to introduce the new system in the future. It's by understanding. Your answer. Uh, from participant, any question for Professor Matsumoto? Okay, this is one question for Professor Ambarianto from Ms. Ismurini from University of Bravijaya. How to manage fish right and allocation in the ocean? Uh, for Ms. Ismurini, as we know that Professor Ambarianto is no longer with us today, uh, right now. So I will deliver, uh, a committee will deliver uh, the question for Professor Ambarianto and hopefully Professor Ambarianto will answer your question directly from the email and we delivered it from, uh, delivery for you. Uh, any more question? Okay, I think there's no question for uh, Professor uh, Matsumoto. 
So, uh, before we closing, that uh, maybe uh, giving certificate, professor, for your participation in this uh, seminar. Uh, please, maybe committee will help me to give certificate for Professor Matsumoto. Maybe it's long distant professor, so the certificate is <laughs> given digitally. <laughs> digitally. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Firstly, we thank you to Professor Dr. Insinyur Ambarianto, MSJ from Indonesia, who already gave the material regarding the role of marine environment in sustainability development. Also, thank you to Professor Matsumoto from Japan, who already gave the material regarding about Society 5.0 and Solid Waste Management. We hope that knowledge will be useful for our future. Ladies and gentlemen, we arrive to the second material session. In this session, we will have two keynote speakers. The first one is Dr. Semiaga from Uganda. The next one is Dr. Mai from Egypt. And the third one is Mr. Mario, PhD from Italy. This session will be guided by Mr. Muhammad Arif Budiharjo, STM Engineering Science, Environmental Engineering, PhD. Uh, but before that, let us read the moderator's uh, CV. All right, Mr. Muhammad Arif Budiharjo, STM Eng, SJ, PhD, currently is lecturer, Department of Environment Engineering at Diponegoro University, Indonesia, and background education is bachelor degree in Civil Engineering, Diponegoro University at Indonesia, and second one is master degree in Environmental Engineering at Griffith University, Queensland, Australia. And the next is Doctor of Philosophy in Geo and Geo Environmental Engineering at Cartin University, Australia. Mr. Arif Budihajo is also a leader of UNDIP Initiative for Sustainability or UNIT and have a professional membership, which is uh, the part of this. Uh, Mr. Arif Budihajo is part of the Institution of Engineers Indonesia, part of Indonesian Society of Sanitary and Environmental Engineers, part of International Solid Waste Associations. The research field that Mr. Arif Budiharjo focused on is on environmental management, focusing on waste management, on landfill and denier, uh, liner, denier stability, on solid waste and landfill management, including environmental sustainability. Without further ado, please welcome our moderators, Mr. Arif Budiharjo.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'd like to welcome all of you to the second international conference on environment sustainability issues and community development 2020. Now we are on the second uh, session of the plenary section. My name is Arif and I'll guide you through the plenary session that will be that will be start in a minute. In this second plenary session, we do have uh, three speakers. The first one, we have Dr. Swipe Semiaga from Uganda. The second one, we have Dr. Mai Sayed Fuad. She is a lecturer of plant and plant ecology from Faculty of Science Egypt. And the third one, we have Dr. Mario Guarasino from University of Casino and Southern Lazio, Italy. In this second plenary session, we actually will start with the presentation for, for, from all speakers and then followed by discussion and question and answer. Before we start, please kindly mute your microphone and on camera. When the keynote speaker session, to make sure that this event will run smoothly. Thank you for your kind attention and cooperation. For the first speaker, I'd like to ask Dr. Swipe Semiaga to present his presentation. For Dr. Swipe, you have, actually we do have uh, 30 minutes for its presenters and then followed by 30 minutes of uh, discussion session. For Mr. Swipe Semiaka, you may proceed with your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, the moderator. I am happy to be uh, at this conference, uh, 2020. Uh, I think I'll share my, uh, my screen uh, briefly. Okay, and I hope it can be, it can be seen. Okay, it can be seen, I hope so. I'm uh, uh, Swaib Semiaga, I'm from Uganda, and uh, at the moment in Uganda it is, I think you can see it's uh, still dark, it's five, uh, uh, about 5.25 uh, uh, a.m. in the morning. Greetings to all of you uh, from Uganda and Kampala, which is the capital of uh, Uganda where I'm based. Uh, today, I'm um, just going to have um, a discussion on fecal sludge management in urban slums of sub-Saharan Africa with a focus on environment, health, and safety uh, implications. I am um, a lecturer at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Makerere University, um, uh, or the government university in Uganda, based in Kampala. And briefly, uh, to just um, give you a glimpse at uh, where I come from, for those of you who have not been uh, in Kampala before, all in, uh, in Africa before. Um, Uganda is in the east of Africa. I think if you can see Africa, uh, the eastern part of Africa, that's where Uganda is, where I'm coming from. And uh, in Uganda, uh, you see that uh, the capital of Uganda is Kampala. Uganda is about 5 million, uh, 45 million people. 
And um, uh, over 45 million people, 1.5 million people reside in Kampala, which is the capital. And the, during that time, this population um, multiplies by two because it's a central business district and people come to work from here. But just like other cities, Kampala has a, a, a good part of it, as you can see in the upper photo. And uh, if you look at the down photo here, uh, these are slum areas in Kampala, which uh, comprise of about 60% of the population in Kampala. This is a proper indication of uh, as many people where they reside in Kampala. These are slum areas, which are unplanned developments, which is not so much different from quite a number of countries found in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And looking at such kind of situations, we have quite a lot of issues when it comes to waste management. Uh, not only the fecal sludge management, which I'm going to talk about for today, but even other different forms of waste. But my point of focus will be on uh, fecal sludge management right uh, in these areas, which are unplanned settlements, which are so many in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. If you look at um, this picture here, sorry, the slide, that uh, shows the different system having a city, you realize that um, in, um, in, in most of the cities, we have sword sanitation and non sword sanitation. Sword sanitation, most of you here are so much uh, aware of sword sanitation, where you just go in a toilet, a flush, and then it goes to the treatment plant. You may even not know where it has gone. But we have another system, fecal sludge management, where you flush or you deposit the material and then it goes in a container next to your homestead. And that one, when it gets full, a truck will come empty and take to the, uh, to the treatment plant. So this is now the second part is what I'm discussing about because over 2.7 million people in the world are using such kind of systems where people deposit, it goes near to your home or even within your compound until when the tank is full, then it will be emptied. And when it comes to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, over 80% of the uh, urban population depend on on-site. And uh, again, as I said, like a situation in Uganda, about 60% reside in slums, even in other parts of uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And these slum areas, we have increased the levels of uh, poor waste management. And one of the key reasons here a high density of housing units, just like uh, this picture down here, which you can see. If you look at that housing unit density, you can see that... Uh, there are even no roads in between there, or even not well-defined roads. Each house you are seeing here, for example, could have a toilet. But when it gets full, where will a truck, for example, pass through in order to get waste from there? So we have a lot of issues because of lack of access. So you find that the management practice has become poor, and people poorly dispose within their living environment, causing a lot of issues, not only on environment, but also on the health of the, uh, of the people. Hence my point of discussion for today. If you look at people and environment in context, people and environment here, the interaction is very interesting, that people are supposed to get, or we, all of us get what we get from the environment, be it water, be it food, it all has connection to environment, it source has connection to environment. But in simple terms, after getting all this from the environment, we take back waste into the environment, like the fecal matter, garbage, liquid wastewater, into the environment. And if you look at what goes into the environment, this creates hazards into the environment. And eventually when the hazards are created, we shall take water from the environment, for example, when it's contaminated, our food when it's contaminated, and this will cause people to be exposed to hazards. Now, our interaction with the environment involves the creation of hazards and also exposure uh, to these hazards uh, to, um, uh, uh, to people. So in simple terms, it's important to know where the issues are or where the hazards are, to, can be exposed to or where they can be exposed to the environment so that they can easily be worked upon at the end of the day to have uh, a better public health and also better 
environment. Now, this is going to be in context to the fecal sludge management chain, right from the user interface where a person goes to a toilet and inter uh, interfaces with uh, maybe a, a, a hole in a pit, maybe uh, a pan, and then generate the fecal matter or the uh, excreta, which will be deposited into a container, the containment. It can be collected and stored in that container. When it is full, then it is emptied and transported to a treatment facility. At the end of the day, there can be reuse or disposal. My point of discussion is going to be on the technologies in urban slums along these chains, and also the impact of these uh, practices on the environment and also health and safety and uh, some minimum requirements at uh, each level of the service chain. Um, I'll, I'll try to be brief at, on each part of the chain. And straight away, I'll talk about the user interface. User interface where a person can be, I think uh, most of us are so, um, uh, we are used to what you are seeing down here, the pan, squat pan, sit pan. Maybe some of you are not used to a pit. And um, uh, luckily now for, unfortunately, it is one of the most common facility within Sub-Saharan Africa, the one you see on top here. Um, uh, it's so much used here in even urban slums, even when it comes to uh, a, a area where I stay like in Kampala, slums, we have uh, so many people lying on a pit latrine here. You find about even over 80% of our population on pits or in slums. We have a few on septic tanks also in slums, but uh, you'll find our, our people here who are using uh, sewage sanitation, who are connected to a sewage treatment plant. Uh, the whole country, the population is less than 10. It ranges between seven and nine uh, percent. So we are relying so much on uh, non-sewage sanitation. And uh, the biggest part, the interface we use here is the pit latrine. So this is a very common in, in sub-Saharan African parts, not only where I come from. And uh, we have high levels of sharing this facility uh, in some areas. Each household does not own a facility, but you may find over more than four households sharing a facility um, uh, uh, in a slum area, meaning now there is a high user load, so they even fill up quite faster. And if you look at the issues of health and safety, the issues here which we have are mainly slips, trips, and falls, meaning there should be a, a high preference in the design of the surfaces where people um, interface with the, with the facility. And there could be risks of diseases when the facility is dirty, uh, implying that there's a need also of uh, having, uh, uh, maintaining these facilities so that they are not dirty. Uh, to have issues of, uh, um, uh, of uh, health risks. I'll, I'll go straight away also to the second part of the chain after the user interface, and that is the collection and storage part or the containment facility where what has been deposited at the interface side goes into a container. Now, at that part of the containment, you'll find that, as I said, that uh, in most parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, I'm giving a, a glimpse a look at Sub-Saharan Africa because I think most of uh, us here do not know so much about what is uh, in uh, what is in Africa. Uh, but uh, a glimpse a look is, as I said, we have more pit latrines than uh, septic tanks when it comes to on-site facilities. And also here, one of the common issue that we have on these facilities is that they are poorly designed. So here we have a poor design of the facilities. We have poor construction of these facilities. And many people, the mansions builders, they take these facilities to be simple and uh, they end up messing up with uh, their design, hence them not performing quite well where they are. You will find that the content, uh, so we, we have facilities when it comes to a pit latrine, for example, which I talked about, and what you can see at the right hand side of the uh, upper right hand side here. Some of these pit latrines are lined while others are unlined. Lined pits is you dig a pit, then you line with bricks, and then you have the uh, plastering and then sealing 
so that all the containment, all, all the uh, fecal sludge which goes in there is contained and does not leak into the environment. That could be a good facility because you have no leakage of uh, leachate into the environment. Uh, the unlined one is you do not line, you just dig a pit, put a slab, a concrete slab with a hole and then a superstructure and people use it. So the unlined part is much more even in, in my country and even in uh, other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, and even where lined are, they do not contain as expected to contain the material because of the poor designs. And you find that even the content for lined and unlined could be the same. So we have uh, really uh, uh, those issues. And another issue we have when it comes to urban slums are substandard houses in slums. You find that, of course, uh, most of our houses in slum areas are not planned uh, settlements, so they are substandard houses. And uh, if, to have a standard toilet or a standard septic tank, it's very rare when the house is not standard or when it is substandard. And these pose risks, for example, leakage of leachate, uh, leachate to the environment, and also risk of collapsing soils when they are unlined. And here we have also issues of uh, uh, smell from the contained, uh, from the uh, contained fecal sludge. And here the minimum requirements could have been having uh, a leak-proof toilet when it is well designed and so for example lined, or a septic tank when it is well designed. And uh, to have, to be able to empty this facility because in many instances, these facilities are designed without any consideration uh, to further emptying and all these present risks also, even during the, uh, uh, the emptying, they present health risks to, uh, the, um, to the actors in the, in, the, in the emptying part. Now, after having the containment, the next part in the chain is when the containment gets full, like a septic tank or pit latrine, and when it gets full, now it goes to the emptying and transport. Emptying and transport here, um, uh, we have um, emptying and transport. We have a facility getting full and uh, other actors, the emptiers, the private emptiers uh, come and they empty the facility. As we said before, one of the challenges we have in emptying is uh, uh, we talked about lack of uh, access for emptying because of poor designs of, uh, of facilities. But even then, when you look at emptying, we can have uh, mechanized and uh, uh, semi-mechanized emptying technologies. And even it goes to manual technologies in these slum areas. But as I said in the beginning, when you look at mechanized technologies, for example, looking at that truck which empties, it may not be able to maneuver through the streets of slums. And you may find that um, uh, because of this, a lot remains in the slum because a truck cannot be able to access. But nevertheless, we have some innovations to cater for such kind of narrow streets we have in, 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 in slums, like what you see, those trucks on, on, on tricycles, are the vacuum tags, which you can see on the other tri bicycles, uh, like the uh, gulpa technology, which some of you know, like a pump pumping into drums, and then people transporting drums to the pickup or to the tricycle, and then it goes to the treatment plant. But you will bear witness with me that uh, one of the challenge now we have uh, with these facilities, which can go to slums, the, uh, the capacity for them is low capacity. Uh, and if it's low capacity, they take low volumes. And uh, one of the most expensive part in waste management is transportation. So if they transport low volumes and they take them to longer distances of at where the treatment plant is, you'll find that uh, it will cost more the people who own the facilities. And in many cases, it is the households who are financed these activities along the chain. So um, again, in emptying, because that becomes expensive for them, what happens in, um, in many cases is people to opt for cheaper options, cheaper options of manual emptiers. And the manual emptiers here, they are cheaper because for them, they don't transport. Uh, hello. 
once, once they empty uh, the facility, uh, after emptying the facility, they dump into the environment. So that means they are not going to go into the cost of transportation to the treatment plant, making them a bit cheaper. And when they become cheaper, then it means now many people will use them and we shall have a lot of issues within the environment because a lot will end up in the environment in slums. We have a lot, um, even where we have access to uh, emptying, where uh, some areas which are near roads, we have, could be having a lot of spillage into the environment, which is a biological hazard. We have a lot of issues when it comes to, um, um, uh, to a direct exposure um, of what comes out of the pit, both to the community, living community where the pits are being emptied, and also to the MTRs who empty these uh, facilities. And here you could find that um, uh, as the beer minimum, we could need people having fully protected gears uh, and also uh, working with the proper equipment uh, containing the water that is being washed from spillages, having the, um, uh, the capacity to wash or disinfect the spillages, having vehicles in good conditions, vehicles um, uh, bearing hazard signs and discharge at the treatment plant would be the required though some of them end up discharging into the environment, even after emptying, uh, having uh, quite a lot of environmental, environmental issues, okay? And this would have been kind of ideal for the emptying uh, service uh, or an emptier, how they are protected and uh, what they need to, um, to protect or to make sure that the transportation vehicles uh, should have in order to have a safer, environment and a better, uh, better public health. Then on side of treatment, treatment here, uh, as I already said, when it comes to a country uh, or a city, uh, a city can have a treatment plan. A treatment plant where fecal sludge goes, for example, could be a co-treatment plant where there is a sewage and then they co-treat with the fecal sludge all it can be only a fecal sludge uh, treatment plant where fecal sludge alone is treated. Uh, and um, you'll find that uh, many, maybe on a country scale, a lot of fecal sludge could go into a treatment plant. But when it comes to Islam in particular, Islam environment, because of the uh, constraints we talked about of lack of space, lack of streets, um, you may find that uh, Little sludge, uh, the documented one, a little, like about less than 10% from the slum areas can be able to reach treatment plants because of those other practices we have that do not cost a lot to the people. So they find that it would be easier to go that simpler way. So um, um, uh, the effluent uh, of these plants uh, many times, like the plants which do the co-treatment uh, has, uh, has not been good. When you talk about co-treatment, fecal sludge uh, being treated with wastewater, many the plants which were designed not to treat two streams at a go. These plants are quite many, and people just decided to empty fecal sludge into existing sewage treatment plants. And because of the properties of fecal sludge being so different from sewage, they end up compromising the treatment uh, processes of a, a plant, and uh, you end up a plant not meeting the discharge standards, hence discharging into the environment effluent which is not well properly treated. That's a risk also to the environment. And to the public health, now this goes mainly to the workers at the treatment plant who can be in direct contact with, uh, um, uh, with the fecal matter, and uh, the minimum here could be them having full PPEs, having a lot of warning signs here and there, training of the workers, and making sure that the effluent meets the discharge uh, standards and many others. And um, uh, also here, we have issues of um, end use. As we said, at the first we had user interface, where we had the containment also discussed, the emptying and transport also discussed, the treatment discussed. And after treatment, we can have end use and also disposal uh, of, of, uh, along the chain. 
if you look at the MDU's part, uh, we, uh, as I said, that uh, we do not have a lot of treatment of fecal sludge within slum areas. So you may find that people who utilize sludge, uh, a small fluxion, maybe some of those that do some practice in agriculture, maybe some compound gardening, some of those who use it, they use it in untreated form. And uh, being in untreated form, of course, now it has quite a lot of risks to uh, crops which are eaten raw, um, where people can eat the crops when they still have pathogens, or even the people who are working with sludge, direct contact with uh, skin, eyes, and even ingestion of, uh, of the sludge. And also after treatment, the dried solids, where we have a treatment plant, the dried solids are, are sold to farmers, but also in many cases, these solids are not, uh, 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 do not reach the required standard for use maybe, for example, in agriculture, also posing risks to the other end use. And also um, uh, one thing here that we uh, need to take note of is the gap, a big gap within what can be got from fecal sludge. There's a lot of work that has been done also, which we have, we have done on energy recovery practices from, uh, uh, from uh, fecal sludge. And also you see that you have a big gap in energy requirements as opposed to other forms of products in slum areas. So if the sludge is, uh, is, is, is turned into energy, we can have a greater benefit uh, or even its usage in slum areas because of uh, the big gap we have in energy requirements in slum areas. But all in all, also people who are in, in the uh, reuse, in the end use practice, they should also be able to know that they need to be protected with PPE. People need to be in, uh, uh, informed to be aware of these products and um, uh, so that they can create the demand for them. And uh, in, 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 in this sense of creating demand, less will be left to go into the, uh, to go into the environment and also following WHO guidelines in, um, uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the, the reuse products meeting those guidelines and uh, application mainly to crops which are non-food crops uh, so that people do not have risks of eating uh, uh, raw crops and uh, finding pathogens within the, uh, within the crops. As I'm winding up the presentation, the last part on the chain comes to the disposal practices. And disposal practices here, as I already discussed before, that uh, of course the disposal here we are talking about in slum area could be even before treatment we have improper disposal practices before treatment. And here you find, say, uh, a, a facility like what you see on the left, a facility, and this facility is raised above the ground. These are areas of high water table. Now we have practices of people releasing the material from the toilet into the nearby drain where the toilet can be. Or when the facility is full, people emptying into the compound, they just dig a hole, empty the sludge into a hole, and then they cover. You can imagine disposing this way. When many people are living here, this is where the kids pray from, people prepare food from. You can see uh, doing laundry from such kind of areas. And this is where people can uh, disposing the sludge. It's really risky. And um, when it comes to, um, uh, to this, of course, this happens in some areas. Even in Kampura, we have some of these practices. Though the, uh, the municipality is working quite, quite a lot to minimize such kind of practices. Um, but also where we have the treatment, uh, after treatment, the treatment plant, we have less of reuse of the effluent after, um, uh, uh, after the treatment. So most of it is always disposed of in the water bodies like rivers, like, um, like, like, like lakes. Uh, this is after treatment, like swamps. This is where it is, uh, it is usually discharged. And of course, the water here we have in the dis disposal part is meeting the different discharge standards. And also the issues of, um, of health and safety of those who are involved in the practice of disposal, or health and safety of those who are exposed when the disposal is within the environment, 
And um, uh, of course, the requirements could be having proper disposal practices uh, so that we do not have this such kind of risks into the um, uh, 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 this kind of risks into the environment and also risks to the uh, to the uh, to the public health. And lastly, I'll draw attention to you to one of uh, 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 what what you call um, uh, uh, the technologies that we have been talking about or practices along the chain in urban slum areas. You can see that. Uh, if we are to, um, uh, to, to have proper technologies uh, within these slum areas, it is pertinent for us uh, to, um, uh, to consider a health and safety and environment as, um, um, uh, 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 as, as actually uh, a prerequisite or as one of the requirements amid the social culture, amid the economic requirements, amid the institutional requirements. But health, uh, public health and, and safety and environment is a, a very crucial. And uh, I think you can see as per um, uh, one of uh, uh, my publication that was in 2015, there was some discussion on the health and safety as a requirement in technology selection uh, along, the, along the service chain. I don't want to talk much more than that. I think um, um, I'm seeing I have about one minute to the end of the presentation. I want to end there. And thank you so much for uh, listening to me. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Swipe. Uh, personally, I'm really happy to hear your presentation. It's quite interesting what happened over there. And some picture is quite uh, interesting as well. So, but... Uh, Hello. Yeah. Hello, Dr. Swipe. Can you hear my voice? Okay. Yeah. Uh, actually, I got some question for you regarding your uh, material that you already presented, but uh, I'm going to wait until the discussion session uh, at the end of the, all the speakers uh, finish. Uh, we'll continue with the next speaker. The next speaker will be, it should be uh, Dr. May Sayed, but unfortunately, uh, she's still not joining us. So we are going to proceed with Dr. Mario first. For Dr. Mario, um, this is the CV for Dr. Mario. Dr. Mario is a senior lecturer in University of Casino and Southern Lazio, Italy. Actually, he also gave presentation for our first conference last year. So we are old friend with uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mario, but uh, due to the technical reason, Dr. Mario cannot be able to join us today. And we are going to play the recording of his presentation. Uh, for all audience, uh, uh, this is the presentation from Dr. Dr. Mario. Thank you. So. Uh, uh, hello uh, to everybody and uh, let me thank the organizers for inviting me once more at this uh, very nice uh, conference. I was um, here at this conference last year in Semarang and uh, I really enjoyed the environment and the fruitful discussions that I had with the colleagues. And uh, I have to say that um, I have been thinking about the discussions we had uh, for all the years. And that's why I decided uh, to uh, continue the, the thoughts and the discussion, the reasoning that I was doing last year, um, this year, with a topic that is complementary, but is also very interesting. 
and uh, in my opinion is uh, very it's worth uh, to uh, to address and um, this topic is exactly uh, machine learning for uh, health data science as you know i am a data scientist so uh, my main uh, objective in my life is to study big quantities of data uh, to try to uh, solve some real world problems and uh, what i realized is that in the field of human health uh, this cannot be done independently of what you have around. So uh, everything that is around you has an impact on your uh, health, on the health of the human being. And this is why I am here to, um, uh, to convince you that it is very important uh, to keep in the loop uh, all the data and the problems can, that come from uh, the analysis of data for uh, uh, human for human for human health so the aim of this talk uh, will be uh, mainly to promote a critical understanding of how data science and machine learning can be used to solve different biomedical problems so as I said, my purpose uh, today is to convince you that it is very important uh, to train new professionals that can have a holistic view of uh, our environment and our world, so the world that is around us. Because the, the choices that we do on the environment will impact on our life and we have to understand that this can be different depending on the persons that uh, we do we have. Um, that we are taking in consideration. So um, I think that uh, from this discussion, what we will understand um, is that uh, we need, uh, we really need uh, data-driven um, analytic strategies. And uh, at the end of this talk, we will be able to uh, take part to conversations about machine learning and uh, data science and uh, we can uh, try to improve also students, our students, understanding about uh, this, uh, this talk. So, in, in all in all, I will uh, talk a little bit about data science, uh, what is big data, machine learning, and uh, I will provide some, a little review of uh, concept and algorithms in, uh, in machine learning. So, the supervised uh, um, techniques and unsupervised techniques, in particular about classification and clustering. And uh, I will show you some examples from my research that are related to health. And I would like again to make clear that the impact on environment on our health is substantial. So all the choices that we do in that field are also impacting our life. So, but where do we start? So when we talk about uh, machine, uh, machine learning, maybe if we go on Google videos, as we can see here, we find more than 14 million uh, videos. So this is uh, quite a lot. And of course, it is not possible to look at them. And even if we don't want to start from uh, videos, but uh, we want to start from books, uh, books on machine learning on Amazon are more than 3,000. So where do we start? And actually, in this search, I also added another keyword to restrict uh, the number of uh, the, the number of hits that I was that I was getting that I was uh, getting back. So I was using the word Python, that is a, a, a programming language very common, very used in in, in data science. So. Uh, too many videos, uh, too many books, and uh, too many papers. Because if we go on Google Scholar, that is a, a, a specific search engine for a scientific uh, papers article, uh, what we find is if we look, if uh, uh, if uh, we search for machine uh, for machine learning, uh, we get back three million. Uh, papers. So there are 3 million scientific papers that uh, use the word machine learning somewhere within uh, the abstract or, or its content. And even if we only limit this search to this year, so to year 2020, we still end up with 70,000 papers. So uh, those techniques are widespread and they are really um, uh, they are really used to solve real world problems. And um, somehow uh, this is connected with another, with another problem, with another fact. The fact that we are producing a lot of data. So in environmental sciences and engineering, we know that many sensors can be used and uh, this will produce a huge amount of data. But what is incredible that uh, at every day each day we produce something like 2.5 quintillion bytes of data. So that is a quintillion is a billion of billions 
of uh, billions of billions. So we produce uh, 2.5 billions of billions of bytes every day. And uh, this speed is accelerating with the growth of the Internet of Things. As I was mentioning last year, it is very simple nowadays to take some sensors and to connect to the Internet and to take the data that they produce, to gather them together, to make them interoperable and to use them for in our applications. And this is also very cheap. I remember that I was actually um, showing uh, some uh, details of, um, of, uh, very, of very cheap devices, very cheap sensors below $2, $1 or $2 that can be uh, used with a very simple um, uh, processing Unix, uh, units like Arduino uh, to make, uh, to, to produce data and to, uh, to deliver them uh, to places where they can be analyzed. And as I was mentioning, this is accelerating, but this is really accelerating. And uh, we know this because in the last two years, we have generated 90% of all existing data. So this is this is a fact that we should uh, that we should definitely take uh, keep in mind because uh, this is really shaping um, our our life. In um, ninety percent of all existing data have been produced only in the last year. So by the end of this year, we will have an amount of bytes that is the minimum um, the, the minimum storage that you can address in a computer. Um, uh, we will have more bytes than forty times the number of stars in the universe. And as we know, this number is quite quite huge. So. Uh, Keeping, uh, keeping up with this huge influx of data is difficult, but the analysis of this data is, of course, even more difficult. And as we know, in many environmental applications, this is actually the case. If um, uh, this, uh, this data uh, are produced in many different applications of environmental engineering, and uh, if we are able to identify meaningful meaningful patterns in the sense that we can understand what is similar to what to detect some uh, specific applications in which we have had very good results then uh, this is very useful and uh, extracting uh, this information will also make us able to produce some knowledge about those, uh, those problems and um, algorithms that we use have been in, invented maybe 20 or 40 or 60 years ago when all this was not yet there so we really need to rethink about the methodologies the data analysis methodologies that we use. Also in, in, the, in the light of what I was mentioning, so the fact that we will need to make uh, data interoperable to put data together in order to have a holistic view of what is happening to the human beings in, within, uh, to each human being within its environment. So this is a nice picture, this is an infographics, and uh, this is produced uh, every year. I think I downloaded it, I don't remember if it was at the end of last year, the beginning of last year, but there is a new one. So if you want the very, uh, the, the latest, uh, the latest version, you need to just search for data never slips, and you will find the updated infographics. But I think this is, this is uh, making, uh, this is uh, just providing useful information. And uh, what is it? This says how much data is generated every minute in our, on our planet. So if we look at some of those systems we, 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 know, we, know, we know well, for example, Twitter, no? we see that, for example, every minute there are half a million tweets or there are eight, nearly 200 million emails every minute. And how many Skype calls? More than 200,000. So what we really realize that there is a very big flux of data that is produced used every minute in a day. And as I was uh, mentioning, uh, actually what happens is that um, this is increasing over and over, uh, over, over and over in, uh, during, uh, during the years. And for this reason, uh, we understand that the problem is becoming more, more and, and more, uh, more and more difficult. And uh, this is also uh, showing the internet population. So in 2018, there were 4.3 billion people connected to the internet. To tell the truth, it's not only people that are producing data, but also machines are producing data. And as far as we know, the data that has been produced, uh, for example, this year, 
um, uh, over the internet is in large part produced by machines that are talking to each other. So the traffic, the data traffic that, that has been produced by sensors and servers talking with other samples, with other servers, is uh, even uh, uh, bigger, the data amount is even bigger than the one that is produced by human, by human beings. So, uh, all this uh, makes us think about the huge availability of data and also the difficulty. So, uh, uh, hello uh, to everybody and uh, let me thank the organizers for inviting me once more at this uh, very nice uh, conference. I was um, here at this conference last year in Semarang and uh, in, uh, to each human being within its environment. So, this is a nice picture, this is an infographics, and uh, this is produced uh, every year. I think I downloaded it, I don't remember if it was at the end of last year, the beginning of last year, but there is a new one. So, if you want the very, uh, the, the, latest, the latest version, you need to just search for data never slips, and you will find the updated infographics. But I think this is, this is uh, making, uh, this is just providing useful information. And uh, what is it? This says how much data is generated every minute in our, on our planet. So if we look at some of those systems we, 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 know, we, know, we know well, for example, Twitter, no? we see that, for example, every minute there are half a million tweets or there are eight, nearly 200 million emails every minute and how many Skype calls? More than 200,000. So what we really realize that there is a very big flux of data that is produced Produced every minute in a day. And as I was uh, mentioning, uh, actually what happens is that uh, um, this is increasing over and over, uh, over, over and over in, uh, during, uh, during the years. And for this reason, uh, we understand that the problem is becoming more, more, and, and more, uh, more and more difficult. And uh, this is also uh, showing the internet population. So in 2018, there were 4.3 billion people connected to the internet. To tell the truth, it's not only people that are producing data, but also machines are producing data. And as far as we know, the data that has been produced, uh, for example, this year, um, uh, over the internet is in large part produced by machines that are talking to each other. So the traffic, the data traffic that, that has been produced by sensors and servers talking with other samples, with other servers, is uh, even uh, uh, bigger, the data amount is even bigger than the one that is produced by human, by human beings. So uh, all this uh, makes us think about the huge availability of data and also the difficulty to take them. In the early days of statistics, uh, analyzing data meant uh, to look at the table and uh, to provide some uh, uh, to structure this, uh, this data in, uh, to produce some information and to apply some algorithms like regressions or other um, uh, to have uh, time series analysis or whatever uh, to produce some knowledge about uh, the problem. Nowadays, this, this situation is changing because it is even difficult to store this data that is arriving so, so, uh, so quickly. And also, as I will point out later, as I will make it clear uh, um, later in this talk, uh, also the, 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 the type of data is very much, is very much, uh, is very much changing. So, all this is called big data. And uh, what do we mean by big data? big data. Well, for sure, we mean uh, that uh, this, this, uh, this data is huge. So it's a huge amount of, da uh, of data. So rather than uh, thousands or millions of uh, rows in a, in a, in a table, um, big data uh, can be billions of rows. So it's very huge amount of data. And uh, standard software cannot handle this. And also the complexity of this data and the uh, Types uh, of data types and uh, data data structures, and um, in the, this uh, the definition we also find another ingredient that is the speed. So this data is produced at a very high speed. And nowadays, if, if we think at personal uh, devices that, for example, are monitoring our blood pressure, um, our heartbeat, and so forth, we see that this is uh, these are producing these uh, these uh, devices are producing data very very fast at, at 
at, uh, at every moment. And so we understand that the speed of this new data creation is incredible. And as new people merge, and as new people come and using those, uh, those devices, uh, of course, data uh, increases in, uh, in volume. Data increases in volume. There are many definitions. So the ones that we find on Wikipedia is big data is a field that treats ways to analyze, systematically extract information from, or otherwise deal with data sets that are too large or too complex to deal with traditional data processing applications software. So what we mean, this data is very big and the software that we have attained now need to be rethink, restructured in order to make use of, um, of data. So I like a different definition. So for me, the big data is when we have all the data related to a problem. So if we think about as a town uh, like Semarang, uh, the, the census will collect all the data of people that are uh, um, that uh, are living in the town. So people that, that are uh, that are just born and people that are uh, that have uh, passed away and so forth. And this data is uh, continuously updated, maybe once a day, maybe once a week. Uh, I really, I really, I really don't know. But in, in, in the end, the census uh, of uh, Semarang will have all the data describing uh, the census of the town. So uh, all the data uh, related to the, the population living uh, living there. And so for me, this data is big because it's completely described. So of course, if we, if, if we take this uh, set of data and we try with this to describe all Java Island, then this will not be big anymore because there are so many people living there and uh, this data is not completely describing uh, the problem. So I have this my small uh, definition of big data and I like to think at problems, uh, big data problems in this, uh, in, in this view. So, but uh, uh, as, I was, as I was mentioning before, uh, big data is characterized by the volume, the volume so the fact that these, uh, these, uh, these tables of data can contain billions of rows, the variety, and the and the, the velocity and uh, when we uh, and of course uh, uh, this introduces uh, new problems and um, and uh, we are not able uh, to uh, completely uh, store this data before processing processing and many times we will need to process it online or as the data comes and we will have some statistics we will compute some statistics and uh, this is the only that we will that we will have all the data will be lost this is for example also happens with the video surveillance data so we have a stream of data but most probably we only store um, situations in which there is something interesting so if nothing is moving in the scene probably we will not collect we will not store this data as soon as uh, something moves then we will uh, we will save we will save this data this will, will be done with a very simple uh, uh, neural network and one layer neural network that will uh, that will recognize moving objects and will will um, uh, trigger uh, the storage uh, uh, of the of this uh, of this uh, of this data and uh, so velocity and uh, variety um, are, are uh, and volume are important but more and more we have also to think about other V's that come into play so other characteristics and in the field of environmental um, sciences and engineering and um, biomedical uh, health data science, uh, it is also important uh, the veracity. The veracity. So can we trust this data? Where do they come from? Are we sure that those data have not been altered by somebody uh, to make some tricks? So to let us think that something is happening, but in the end it is not. And also the reputation and the origin, this is very important because when we gather data, we have to be sure that this data is uh, is trustable. No? It's, uh, uh, we, can, we can trust the data that, uh, that we have. And also the availability, the accountability, because somehow we want this flux of data to be stable and feed our system constantly and not being there uh, at some points. And also there is also, uh, there is also another V that in my opinion is very important and uh, this is, uh, it is, this is the, the value, the value, the value of the data. This is uh, something people don't think about very much and uh, this is, uh, uh, I think this is connected with the, 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 the informativeness of data that we have. So how informative 
is the data that we are collecting? Are really, is it really worth? And this is a, still an open problem. We don't know many times. We don't know in advance which are the features, the characteristic of a problem that we should that we should study. But if the data is uh, is um, is produced at the real time, then going back to the planning and adding those more characteristic sometimes is costly or not even possible, depending on the application we are we are we are thinking um, we are thinking about. So. Who is driving? What's, what is driving this uh, data? Well, for sure, uh, all the smart things that we have, so smart cities, smart grids, smart everything, is producing a lot, a lot of, uh, of data. And also mobile sensors. Our mobile phones are producing GPS traces, they are producing videos, and uh, they are uh, producing other type of data that is flooding, that is flowing in the, in, in the internet. And of course, also other uh, characteristics. And uh, medical Im imaging and uh, gene sequencing is also providing a, 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 huge, a huge amount of data. And we should, uh, we should really, we should really uh, think about this, because uh, those technologies are becoming a widespread, uh, uh, are becoming more and more available, and they are producing more and more data. And uh, when the prices Will, will go down, and then we will have uh, um, sequencing for every single person, and this will produce a huge amount of data, also because sequencing needs to be redone every now and then, uh, especially sequencing of molecules that might vary during the life of a, of a person. So, and uh, the, the uh, the data, um, the data growth uh, is not uh, is not uniform among the various type of data. So we have some data that is very structured. So, for example, the um, data that is uh, con collected by the census is very structured data. But uh, there are other types of data that are increasing more and more. Let me do an example just to to uh, to, to explain. So this is a, a, an example of structured data. A data table. This is, for example, the the result of a, a, a gene expression experiment. So we are trying to understand the abundance of uh, the molecules produced by the genes of some people in, the, in some different conditions. So health, healthy versus diseased people. And of course, this is a table. So the table is a very it's a, it's a structured data. We can store and we can use standard algorithm to understand. There are data that is semi-structured. So, uh, for example, uh, if we have a, a, a web page, if we have a web page, we know that behind there is a, a, an HTML uh, uh, code uh, that produces this. Um, this. And uh, the, the fields of this HTML code is, uh, is fixed, so we can have a title rather than uh, other uh, paragraph or, or whatever. But the way in which we organize this is always different, moving from one from one website to another. So this is a semi-structured data. Then there is something called quasi-structured data, for example, the results of our Google search. So and um, uh, when we query, we have a, a first page, the one that is uh, that is um, that is numbered and number one. Uh, on top uh, on, on top of the slide and um, uh, and the number one and uh, and this is structured so there are some snips of code of text and they are all the same for all the website but then when we click on it then we go in a website and so this makes the all the data uh, quasi quasi structured data then there is unstructured data uh, for example videos in sense that, of course, the, the, the data is a structure, there is a data structure, no? so we can play a movie on a computer, so there exists a file format that stores this data, but what is inside here, so the information that is contained is unstructured, so when we look at video, we don't know unless we have already seen it, what is going to happen, what is, and the analysis of this data is very, very, is very, very complex, and it is more and more interesting to have information about this type of, uh, uh, of this, uh, of data. For example, also uh, images and videos that come from satellites uh, to understand what is, what is happening, for example, in case of flood or a fire or whatever is, is, is going on. So uh, understanding what is inside is, uh, this unstructured data is very important, but also very, very difficult. So very challenging. It's a very challenging, it's a very challenging um, problem. 
So what I was, as I was mentioning, all machine learning activities in the last um, uh, are always so. The machine learning activities are always the last thing that we do. So. Uh, we collect the data, but the analysis part is always the very last thing that uh, uh, people let us uh, the people let us do, and this is the reason why uh, somehow this is limited because we 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 get the data when maybe it is uh, too too late, and also there is also a problem because the data is analyzed in uh, small projects, maybe large or larger, but still the compartmentalized. So uh, every project is uh, something in itself, and this, of course, uh, is not uh, is not easy to uh, this is not easy not easy to handle. And uh, this is another way uh, to look at the sources. And again, as I was mentioning, we need to um, uh, we need to understand that uh, most of the data is coming uh, is, is some some of the data and a big part of the data is coming from uh, genetic uh, sequencing and uh, medical imaging so we have to take uh, we need really to take care of this so uh, when uh, to analyze this data it should uh, now be clear that uh, you need uh, several uh, you need several competencies uh, put together uh, for this uh, for the for this purpose and so we need uh, expertise from computer science uh, from mathematics and uh, people that are expert of uh, the knowledge of the of the domain so we need people for example in health application life science application we need people that are expert of this but uh, we need to put everything together to get uh, to get a solution so let's go to some of the applications uh, uh, that we have uh, that we have in health and that, that are strictly connected with in, uh, what is happening in the environment around us so there are uh, uh, some of the applications are related to genomics and drug discovery so we want to accelerate uh, drugs but drugs we need drugs our body needs drugs um, very often because there is something in connection with the environment in which we are and the environment of course is um, is shaped by uh, human activities so our choices that are related to the, the environment have an impact on our uh, on our uh, on our uh, on our uh, health and uh, also there are um, there are other applications that are more related to um, real world evidence and the commercial analytics but i don't want to comment uh, i don't want to comment uh, on this. So, uh, as I was mentioning, the uh, applications in health are so widespread. They start with the medical uh, imaging, so the analysis of, of, uh, of data um, uh, that comes from CT scan, MRI, and, uh, and uh, so forth. And uh, also, uh, there is also a need of, um, of uh, expert systems that, my, that can, uh, can be used for diagnosis and, uh, and, uh, and prognosis. And, and, and there are also some other uh, there are also uh, other applications, for example, the modeling of ecosystems or uh, population dynamics and the network biology and so forth. And now we will go to some um, to the to the definition of of, of machine learning. So uh, machine learning refers to a, a set of tools for understanding uh, for understanding uh, data. And what we do is we train a computer for this for this purpose. So we take some questions for which the, the answer is known, and we train a computer. Um, a train a computer uh, to answer new questions for which the answer is not yet uh, is not yet known. And in general, uh, those um, uh, those uh, methods are broadly classified in supervised and supervised and unsupervised. So, but what type of problems can we solve? For sure, we can train a computer to answer questions. So we have a set of questions for which uh, the answer is known, yes or no, black or white, healthy or disease, and uh, we take this data to build a model. A statistical model and then using this model we can uh, try to provide answers to new questions for which the answer is not known. <coughs> 
then we can try to find patterns in data. So we try to put together things that are similar and, and to keep apart from, from things that are not similar and uh, uh, determine important variables or detect errors in our data or uh, trying to detect a certain behavior. So all those things can be solved using machine learning. And as I was mentioning, there is this big there, is a, there are those two broad classes. The one in which you use an a priori, in which you use an a priori um, knowledge to train your system, and this is usually called supervised learning. In the sense that there is a supervisor that is providing a prior information that you plug in the model. Or there, are, there is also unsupervised learning, that is uh, the thing in which, there, that is the situation in which you don't have this prior knowledge and you just, um, and you just um, use what you see to gather some information, to extract some, some information. So, and uh, now for the application, in the very last uh, minute that I have, uh, I will talk about uh, uh, some applications that are related with the uh, an environment. So the first study, that one of the studies that I, I did uh, a, a few years ago was uh, studying um, climate changes and how climate changes affect our uh, uh, um, our metabolism. So, who uh, who is more affected by climate changes? And uh, this is, of course, a very important problem because climate changes also in response to some human activity. And so, how this will shape our metabolism is, of course, very important because uh, in different part, uh, different people might behave might behave differently. Might might have. Uh, so climate change might have a different impact on different persons. And uh, we use uh, machine learning to, to, und to, understand, uh, to understand this in a very simple uh, organism that is uh, Drosophila. Then we, tried to, we also tried to understand, which is uh, um, to predict the drug activity. So when the drug is active on some why and when the drug might be helpful for, uh, for some specific group of patients. And uh, this is also something that of course is important because in a population, uh, population might be affected by some cases that come from an, uh, the environment. We need some drugs to heal them, but we know that the drugs will work differently on different people. Then uh, this is the effect to smoke exposure. So uh, the, the, we know that pollutants uh, affect our life and we were using machine learning to detect uh, if uh, people had been affected by uh, smoke in particular and uh, what was the effect of the smoke on them. So just to conclude uh, this talk, what I wanted, uh, what I was talking uh, today is, um, is machine learning and the application in the field of health. And I wanted to make clear that uh, we cannot consider health as something that is, uh, completely, uh, that is completely detached from the environment in which we are. So the, the, the choices that we do on our environment very often impact on the human health. And this is why we need new practitioners, new professionals, trained by our university that can talk with environmental engineers and scientists and with people that come from the human health. And this is, this is what I really think, that this is very important, this is really the future. So uh, let me thank you again. I hope that uh, next year I will be present in person to this very beautiful uh, conference and I wish you all uh, luck and uh, a success and a good health. Thank you. Uh, hopefully, we can see each other next year with all the speakers in Smarang, yeah? Uh, we apologize for a little disturbance during the video uh, recording, but hopefully uh, that issue didn't take your enthusiasm during this conference. So we are now proceed to the next speaker, which are Dr. Mai Syed Fouad. Yeah. So, hello, Dr. Mai. Uh, we are waiting for you uh, quite with a bit uh, nervous because you are unable to join the Zoom meeting, right? Yeah. And thankful 
that you are now with us. And before we start, I'd like to introduce Dr. Maya Syed Fuad Abdul Al Aziz. She's a lecturer at Faculty of Science, Fayyum University, Egypt. What time is it now, Dr. May, in Egypt? Dr. Mai, please to unmute the microphone, please. I couldn't hear your voice. All right. Yeah. Thank you. That is unmute. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mai. Yeah. What time is it now in Egypt now? Uh, in Egypt now, uh, there's uh, 5.30 a.m. 5.30 in the morning. Oh. Uh, that's a, a really... Actually, I couldn't sleep this night. Oh, well, um, we really appreciate that, Dr. Mai, because uh, we, we, we take your bedtime for this uh, uh, conference, but we do appreciate uh, your time. Uh, Dr. Mai has actually held a degree, a PhD degree from... Uh, is it the... From I could actually I couldn't see the the, the letter. Leib Leibniz University, Doctor May, is it correct in uh, plant ecology? Yes, I'm okay. a lecturer in plant ecology. All right, that's good. So, Doctor May, uh, uh, you have uh, 30 minutes to do your presentation, and after that, we proceed with the uh, discussion. Uh, Doctor May, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. You hear me? Yeah, yes, I, uh, we can hear you. Would you please share the screen, Dr. May? Uh, I will share the presentation now. What is the sound is clear for you? Uh, not yet, we haven't seen the slide. I couldn't hear you. Yeah, actually, we, we didn't see the slide. So, would you please share the screen? Okay. Is it clear now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it showed the slide now. Thank you, Dr. May. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Dr. May Said Fouad from Egypt. I am a lecturer in plant ecology. Uh, Faculty of Science, Fayoum University, uh, and it is my pleasure uh, to join your second international uh, conference, which uh, held via uh, Zoom application. Uh, it is the first time to attend a conference via uh, Zoom, Zoom application, and it's my pleasure. Uh, our session today uh, is concerning with green infrastructure. Uh, but before uh, we're talking about green infrastructure, uh, let me tell you the story of uh, infrastructure world. Uh, what does it mean? What does infrastructure world mean? I think all of us uh, know the meaning of infrastructure. Infrastructure. Uh, is a network of services and facilities which offers by all governments for the sake of uh, society uh, or uh, community, uh, like uh, means of transportation, uh, roads, electricity and power, uh, sewer system, hospitals, 
uh, and many other sources. And I think it is not new for you uh, to know uh, the examples of infrastructure. Uh, but uh, I think uh, it was necessary uh, to uh, explain or to remind you with the uh, word infrastructure uh, before uh, we put any color before it. Uh, now uh, we go to uh, infrastructure colors. What are colors of infrastructure? Uh, actually, when uh, I uh, research uh, or during my research for this presentation, I found three different colors for infrastructure. Uh, blue infrastructure, gray infrastructure, and green infrastructure. Blue infrastructure uh, comes from uh, the color of water and refers to uh, water uh, floods, uh, pools, uh, rivers, uh, and so on. Gray infrastructure is the uh, concrete color and refers to cement and steel. Green infrastructure uh, comes from plant color and refers to uh, forest, trees, uh, fields, and so on. Uh, now, uh, we try to uh, explain uh, each uh, one of them uh, in some details. Uh, firstly, blue infrastructure uh, is uh, not always appear uh, singly in literature. It always appear uh, in a combination uh, with gray infrastructure or with green infrastructure. Uh, because the blue infrastructure, as we mentioned before, refers to a water element. Uh, so water element should be contained uh, in a container or should be processed in something else. Uh, so uh, it is not uh, uh, clear uh, in the literature uh, that blue infrastructure appear itself. It also appear, uh, it uh, usually appears uh, in a combination with gray or a green uh, infrastructure. Uh, when we talk about gray infrastructure, uh, we refer to uh, cement, steel, and concrete. Uh, but in more explanation or more clarification, gray infra infrastructure uh, is uh, considered as a human uh, engineered uh, infrastructure, uh, which contained uh, water, like you see here, uh, a pipe uh, of water, which may be made of uh, steel uh, or plastic or uh, any other material. Uh, so gray infrastructure uh, is a traditional method uh, for uh, uh, water uh, running. Uh, so by time, uh, this type of infrastructure, I mean gray infrastructure, will face a big challenge uh, during future floods and the climate change uh, we know the load uh, of water, wastewater, and mixed water like storm water uh, will be a heavy load uh, that the gray, gray infrastructure uh, will not be able uh, to carry or to uh, process well. So uh, now uh, we should face this challenge uh, and we should be ready with an appropriate solution. Guess what will be the appropriate solution uh, for the overload which will face a uh, gray infrastructure? I think uh, nature investment is a good solution. You know nature investment. Nature investment, as you see, uh, in general, uh, it means green infrastructure, uh, which is our a main topic in our session today, green infrastructure. Uh, we can consider it uh, a modern uh, definition or a modern word uh, expressing nature investment. Uh, green infrastructure uh, means generally uh, that uh, let green color invade our life, uh, or it may be uh, a demand for uh, thinking green, uh, live green uh, and do everything in a green way if we can uh, and this will be 
a good opportunity for conservation of our natural resources. Uh, so green infrastructure, as we see in this diagram, uh, is a multidisciplinary approach, uh, which uh, dealing with biodiversity conservation, climate adaptation, climate mitigation, and other ecosystem services. Uh, so uh, when we come to definition of green infrastructure, uh, green infrastructure uh, is a parallel infrastructure or another uh, infrastructure beside artificial uh, few minutes ago or few seconds ago uh, we were talking about gray infrastructure gray infrastructure is a kind of artificial infrastructure but green infrastructure uh, is a natural uh, or a mix or mosaic or integrated infrastructure from nature and man-made ecosystem so it is an integrated infrastructure between nature and man. Uh, this is maybe one of the definition of green infrastructure. Uh, as we see, a similar kind of infrastructure exists and offered by nature. Uh, in the second slide, uh, let's watch uh, a short video uh, to uh, uh, more explanation of green infrastructure definition. I hope it is working. Now, welcome back uh, after uh, you were uh, after you were watching a video, uh, and I hope uh, it was useful for you. Uh, as we still talking about uh, a green infrastructure uh, definition, uh, European Union uh, adopted uh, a certain uh, definition for. Uh, green uh, infrastructure. Uh, firstly, uh, we should know that uh, we have many practices and projects uh, which are lying under the umbrella of uh, green infrastructure. Uh, so everyone or uh, uh, every uh, country uh, or every group uh, can uh, adopt uh, the definition of GI from uh, their or her or his point of view. Uh, according to European uh, Union, uh, 
uh, green uh, infrastructure uh, definition uh, referring to management of water and uh, restoration of natural ecosystems. This is from a uh, European Union perspective. Uh, from other perspectives, uh, we may find, uh, if we uh, search uh, via internet, uh, many different identification, uh, but I think uh, the main uh, identification or the main idea from uh, green infrastructure uh, will reach uh, or already reach it uh, to you. Uh, the next slide. Uh, is talking about green infrastructure history or uh, at what time uh, the term green infrastructure appears. Uh, actually, uh, green infrastructure uh, dates back uh, to 1994, 1994 in an appealing report. Uh, this appealing report uh, was raised to Florida uh, governor uh, from the uh, citizens uh, request or demand uh, a way to conserve their natural resources. Uh, and why GI or why green infrastructure? Why we should uh, thinking about green infrastructure? Uh, because green infrastructure uh, offers many advantages. It is an alternative solution for gray uh, infrastructure. If you remember from a few minutes, we were talking about gray infrastructure and the overload which will face gray infrastructure uh, show. So I'm sorry, uh, green infrastructure is an alternative solution for gray infrastructure. Uh, green infrastructure uh, is considered as a nature investment uh, from two to three slides before. We already uh, said that uh, nature investment is uh, a synonym uh, or uh, uh, another meaning of a green infrastructure. Uh, green infrastructure also uh, help us in increasing by the or for saving biodiversity, and it is a cheap technology. It is not expensive at all. Uh, it will be a helpful way uh, to conserve our drainage system and its sustainability. Uh, what are the scales of green infrastructure? Uh, actually, we have two main scales for green infrastructure, uh, local scale and regional scale or scale of city. Local scale like permeable pavement and green roofs, while scale of uh, city uh, mimic the nature uh, or uh, targeted a larger scale. Uh, two main issues uh, we should talking about when we uh, target the impacts and benefits of green infrastructure. Uh, please don't confuse the FUC GI. GI uh, is an abbreviation of green infrastructure, uh, the main uh, topic of our session. Uh, we have two main issues, uh, life cycle assessment and green building assessment. What is life cycle assessment and what is green building technology? I'm sorry. Uh, life cycle assessment is a tool or a method. Method for what or tool for what? A tool uh, for estimation of the impact and benefit uh, which uh, comes from or which arise from the implementation of uh, green technology. Uh, and for uh, good luck here, we have a case study from Villanova University uh, in Philadelphia, uh, USA. Uh, this case study uh, started uh, in 2012. Uh, this case study uh, uh, is an example of bioinfiltration rain garden. Uh, before uh, we explain uh, the case study, uh, let us uh, 
explain what is biofiltration rain garden. Uh, as we see in the next slide, bioinfiltration rain garden. Uh, these pictures uh, explain uh, beginning of bioinfiltration rain garden comes from uh, if our country or your country or any other country uh, have uh, a lot of storm water or uh, run of uh, water in excess, uh, this country uh, mm, may make a benefit from this storm water by collecting them in a catchment area. So the beginning of bioinfiltration rain garden uh, is a collection of storm water in a catchment area. This catchment area should be impervious, uh, so uh, water will be collected and not dissipated or penetrated uh, in the uh, sublayers or subsoils. After the collection of this uh, runoff, uh, then uh, an artificial type of soil uh, is already prepared uh, with planting uh, some gardens, as you see in this picture. This is the inlet of water from the catchment area. And then this is an artificial soil from about three layers and uh, it is uh, built uh, on the existing soil. The already existing soil, we put uh, another artificial layers uh, on it uh, and uh, we start uh, the planting of our garden. Uh, then uh, after time or by time, the excess of water will be flow from the outflow. Uh, but this outflow will not mix or combine in sewer system. Or if it is combined, so it will be uh, in a reduced form, uh, not the whole load which were come or which was come from the catchment area. So as we see, the benefit from uh, this pie infiltration uh, rain garden uh, is how to uh, make the storm water uh, benefit and uh, how it uh, separate uh, it from uh, sewer water and during uh, its uh, passage from inlet to outlet uh, it will be uh, passing through these plants or these garden uh, it will be uh, uh, filtrated uh, from some pollutants, some sediments. Uh, so uh, I think uh, this picture uh, could be a green lung, green lung for breathing. Uh, it is reduced uh, pollution and it's increased uh, the immunity for uh, human uh, and it will be good for uh, human health. Uh, so, uh, uh, our topic was a case study in Villanova, uh, which is around by infiltration rain garden. Uh, and after uh, our explanation of by infiltration rain garden, uh, let's return to the case study of Villanova University. A uh, case study of Villanova University on biofiltration or bioinfiltration rain garden. Uh, have main objective or has main objective. These objectives are uh, applying methods and the tools for green uh, green infrastructure assessment uh, with specific life cycle assessment. Number two, assessment of applicable models. Number three, identifying impact through life cycle uh, of uh, green infrastructure practice. Number four and the last uh, one from the objective uh, is registration of recommendation for uh, green infrastructure implementation. So this is the main objective uh, of the case study. Uh, now, uh, any study uh, to guarantee its success, uh, it could be uh, lying under the umbrella uh, of many standards. 
Uh, here, uh, this case study uh, lie under the umbrella uh, of ISO, uh, International uh, Organization of Standards, uh, New SA. Uh, these standards, or according to these standards, our case study, which we are talking about, comprises four phases. Uh, what are uh, these phases? Number one, uh, goal and definition phase. Goal and definition phase. Uh, phase. Uh, the aim or means this uh, phase uh, means that the aim and scope should be clear uh, and focus uh, on the target of the study. Uh, phase two or number two, life cycle inventory. Life cycle inventory phase which comprises three other phases. But firstly, what, uh, what is life cycle inventory uh, phase? Life cycle inventory phase is a phase concerning of uh, information collection. Uh, what does it mean, information collection? Uh, it means collection of uh, reviews, surveys, records, uh, photographs, uh, and uh, all the information uh, necessary for uh, the beginning of our uh, experiment or our trial. Uh, it comprises three phases, uh, construction phase, operation phase, and decommissioning phase. What is construction phase? Construction phase uh, is the starting phase. Uh, what shall we do in this phase? Uh, in this phase, uh, I think it... Uh, it targeted uh, site uh, establishment, uh, starting materials, uh, starting programs like softwares uh, that we will need in our experiment. Uh, so it targeted the equipment of our trial or our experiment. Uh, second phase, the operation phase. Operation phase includes inputs, outputs. Uh, it also includes uh, monitoring uh, of the experiment, maintenance. Uh, I, I mean, uh, operation phase, uh, in other words, it is the observation of the processing of our experiment. Uh, last phase is the decommissioning phase. Decommissioning phase is the uh, phase at which the experiment is ended. Uh, this phase, uh, I think, uh, from uh, environmental uh, perspective, uh, means uh, how can uh, how we can recycle uh, the uh, disposal material uh, without uh, harm uh, harm at our environment. Uh, Maybe in this phase, we may face uh, some problem like uh, clocking of, of the artificial soil. You, you remember uh, the bioinfiltration picture uh, that we were talking about. Uh, in this picture, uh, by the time, uh, so artificial soil uh, will be clogged with sediment and pollutants, uh, so it will be uh, a need uh, to uh, change uh, this soil uh, or to clean it. Uh, this is about decommissioning uh, phase. Uh, number three, life cycle assessment uh, phase. Uh, this phase is uh, talking uh, about how to evaluate the results uh, from the previous phase, how to evaluate the results of life cycle inventory uh, phase. Uh, in this phase, according to uh, EPA, you know EPA, uh, EPA Environmental Protection Agency, USA, uh, put some software uh, programs uh, to estimate or to evaluate uh, how bioinfiltration rain garden uh, uh, assessment uh, will be done. Uh, bio uh, infiltration uh, rain garden is useful in uh, reducing climate change, global warming, uh, and uh, to uh, it is important or beneficial in human health uh, and human immunity. Uh, software. Uh, uh, from EPA, 
can evaluate if these uh, targets uh, are reached or not. And this is uh, the uh, target of number three, life cycle impact assessment. Uh, last phase is life cycle interpretation phase. Life cycle interpretation phase is a phase of recommendations and conclusions. Uh, which uh, promote the, implement, the implementation of green infrastructure uh, and explain its importance. Next slide. So uh, the end of this case study, Villanova uh, University uh, Bioinfiltration uh, Rain Garden, uh, the, this study threw a light spot uh, on an improved understanding and refined uh, green infrastructure design for a broadened uh, range of sustainability uh, goals. This is the benefit or the feasibility of this study uh, to improve and broaden uh, our uh, knowledge and understanding of uh, green infrastructure. Uh, but actually, by the way, uh, the Villanova University case study uh, is still working. Uh, as we said, it is starting at uh, 2012, but it is still working. Actually, uh, it is in uh, operation phase. Uh, now we come to the uh, second main issue uh, of impact and, be and benefits of green infrastructure, which is green building technology. What is green building technology? A green building technology, uh, a new technology uh, in which we should replace uh, our ordinary building materials with eco-friendly ones. Uh, according to uh, EBA, uh, Environment uh, Protection Agency. Uh, this practice, uh, I mean green building technology, uh, adopted uh, in developed uh, country rather than developing uh, countries. Uh, many organizations impressing or adopted the concept uh, of uh, green building technology. Uh, I, I mean, uh, adopt the idea and try to uh, educate uh, how people will uh, raise their awareness towards this uh, technology. Uh, these organizations uh, are uh, U.S. Green Building Council, Bureau of Energy Efficiency, and Indian Green Building Council. Uh, next slide will show us different material, different natural material. Uh, which uh, may be used in building uh, some eco-friendly uh, houses, as you see. Uh, in this discipline, I mean discipline of green building technology, without any bias, uh, because I am Egyptian, but without any bias, uh, it comes to my mind one of the famous pioneers uh, in the field of building technology, the, the Egyptian architect uh, engineer Hassan Fathi. Uh, Hassan Fathi uh, is a pioneer uh, of this field. Uh, Hassan Fathi was born uh, in uh, 1900, uh, since uh, uh, 100 years and 20. Uh, and of course, uh, it dies. Uh, but uh, uh, his ideas uh, and uh, designs uh, still alive. Uh, the main perspective of uh, Hassan Fathi uh, is uh, how to use uh, a cost benefit material or cheap materials in building houses in poor countries. Uh, this is the main idea or the main perspective uh, of Hassan uh, Fathi, uh, he tried uh, to use a mud prike material in constructing of uh, houses. 
green building uh, technology uh, is considered as an invitation. Invitation to whom? Invitation to whoever interested in environmental sustainability. Uh, anyone uh, of us uh, interested in environmental sustainability, uh, I think, uh, like uh, to live in a green uh, building uh, uh, houses, uh, which is made of or uh, uh, building uh, uh, built from uh, eco-friendly uh, materials. Uh, many benefits uh, we can gain uh, from a green building technology. Uh, it is economics uh, in energy uh, because uh, uh, houses uh, designed uh, in this uh, regard uh, already uh, with a good ventilation. The, the design, the dome design, I guarantee a good ventilation of this kind of buildings. Uh, so we will not be in need to uh, some uh, devices or equipment uh, like air conditions, uh, which is energy uh, saving and which is uh, reduce the uh, problem of climate uh, change. Uh, this is in turn reduced global warming also. Building material uh, are uh, safe in this technology. Uh, it is not uh, harmful for the environment. This is in turn uh, useful or good for environment and uh, human health and uh, amenity as we see as uh, the advantages or privilege of green uh, building technology. <clears throat> uh, in Egypt, uh, green building technology, uh, although the establishment of Egyptian Council of Green Building uh, in 2009, but its job or its implementation uh, wasn't done and its uh, rule wasn't clear. Uh, or implemented also. Uh, why? Uh, because uh, some reasons like uh, lacking of architectural education, uh, no one of us, no one of us are uh, authorized to push anyone uh, to uh, educate uh, and uh, architecture. Uh, I think professionals only who can do uh, this. Uh, and unavailable sources of green knowledge. Uh, number three, uh, some governments uh, put some laws and legislation uh, and uh, request for a great number uh, of documents, uh, which is considered as uh, complexity in the uh, process of uh, green building technology or in implementation of green building technology. Uh, but anyway, green building technology is appropriate uh, for uh, poor and for rich, as we see in the next slide. Uh, herein, uh, we can see green build technology for rich and poor people. Here is lecture or luxury and green design, eco-friendly home, and here is low cost eco-friendly home. So it is benefit or beneficial for both uh, rich and uh, poor people. Uh, many studies, uh, as we see, are held emphasizing privilege of green technology. Uh, green technology, uh, I think uh, the uh, letters uh, are small, but I couldn't maximize them anyway. I try. Uh, here in uh, this study emphasize uh, that uh, green building technology uh, is efficient in water, efficient in uh, energy, 
uh, and uh, guarantee a good uh, quality of building. Uh, it is saving of uh, people uh, income. Uh, and uh, it is a, a new access uh, for new land, so it uh, offers land accessibility of people. Uh, but a great problem or a great challenge is awareness, uh, which is always uh, low, and we should try to raise our awareness uh, towards uh, green technology. Uh, uh, even it is uh, green infrastructure, uh, green uh, building technology, uh, life cycle assessment. Uh, as we said before, we should think green. Now, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Dr. May. Uh, now, before our discussion session, uh, it is uh, my a great opportunity to enhance uh, tourism between Egypt and Indonesia. Uh, it was my pleasure uh, when I visited Indonesia uh, since 2015, and this is my uh, photo. Uh, in uh, one famous temple in Indonesia. Uh, and this is your return. Uh, I hope uh, that you will come soon to Egypt uh, and uh, to uh, go together uh, to visit uh, Wadi al Hitan, uh, which is uh, one of the famous UNESCO heritage uh, sites in Fayoum, uh, the Persian uh, Egypt. Uh, and also, hopefully, uh, I will attend your third uh, international conference uh, during the second year, inshallah. Uh, thank you for your uh, attention. And now, uh, the discussion session. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. May. What an interesting uh, presentation. And hopefully, uh, you can visit Semarang, Indonesia, by next year, if the pandemic is already gone. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we are now in a discussion session. We already have some participants lined up for asking questions. So I'm going to call some of them. The first one will be Mrs. Ari Pujiwati. For Mrs. Ari Pujiwati, would you would you please uh, turn on the camera and also microphone, and you may ask the question directly to the speaker. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Ari. I'm from the Ministry of Energy, Mineral. Resources, Republic of Indonesia. <clears throat> I have two questions for Dr. Semiaga and also for Dr. Guarasino. For Dr. Semiaga, are there any risks and results of crops for using untreated vehicles sludge for agriculture and also for human beings? Uh, for instance, the risk of organic sludge and so forth. And also for Dr. Mario Guarasino, um, thank you for uh, thank you for the presentations for all the presenters. Uh, I also had some studies regarding, uh, related with machine learnings. And <clears throat> I have a question that the challenge in machine learning application is to scrutinize the uncertainty variables related with human interactions and also with human interpretations and also with the no human knowledge. For instance, in public health science, uh, so it is easy to scrutinize the variables of certain data. But if it is related with some uncertain data, for example, that I mentioned before, um, human perceptions, uh, the machine could work too automatically and sometimes could not incorporate the human perceptions. So how could we incorporate human perceptions to the machine learning models? So thank you. I hope... Uh, uh, 
So, so thank you for the, the uh, for the sessions. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Ari. Uh, for Dr. Semiaga, would you please directly answer the question? For Dr. Mario, uh, we apologize uh, because Dr. Mario is not here at the moment. Uh, we are going to pass your question to him uh, by email. Thank you. For Dr. Semiaga, uh, please. Dr. Semiaga, I think your microphone is still on mute. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the host muted, muted my microphone. Uh, may, may I just please get a question clearly? The question was not clear on uh, fecal sludge and agriculture use. Uh, just uh, clearly, maybe. So I type my questions in the chat column, so if it's not clear enough, I chat. I, I type it in the chat columns. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I already typed my questions. Oh. Ah, before. Could you read it? Not, I will type again. Uh, then, okay, 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 okay. Thank I'm you. seeing it. Okay, uh, are there any risk and uh, result of uh, uh, crops for using untreated fecal sludge application for agriculture? Yes, uh, definitely the uh, risks for um, uh, using an untreated sludge, because untreated sludge has uh, a lot of pathogens. So the when the first of all the risk is to the people who are using it because they have a risk of exposure to the pathogens, and secondly also the risk is on to the consumers of crops mainly when it is applied on crops that are eaten raw. Um, uh, a good example of some of the crops that I have applied before, people have applied like on, uh, on cabbages, on uh, sukuma, which these are greens which usually people eat raw and they grow up in a shorter period of time. So this period of time does not allow the pathogens to, um, uh, to die uh, and people may find themselves eating uh, the crops when they still have the pathogens. But if they're applied to um, uh, crops which are um, non-food crops, like trees, those ones, the risk is very low because they are not consumed, or crops which take a long time for them to be eaten, like crops which take years to grow. Uh, by the time the people eat the crop, uh, maybe the pathogens have, have died because of uh, environmental conditions. But for those which grow faster, it is very risky, and the risks are already there. We have quite a number of cases uh, that have been documented, um, even in my country, for use of untreated uh, fecal sludge. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Samiaga. Uh, and for the next, for the next participant who like to ask, it's gonna be Mrs. Nadia Paramita. For Mrs. Nadia Paramita, would you please uh, ask the question directly to the speakers, and would you please? Uh, turn on the camera and also microphone. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. Or, uh, 
Dr. May and for the second presenter. Uh, my name is Nadia. I'm from Binawan University. And I have uh, two questions for Dr. May and also one question for, uh, I'm sorry, the professor from Uganda. Uh, my first question is for Dr. May. Uh, historically, how much a green infrastructure could minimize the disaster, such as flood or earthquake or water scarcity in uh, Egypt? Yeah, I think we got a bad connection over there. And then second, uh, well, and maybe one more. Uh, can you also explain what are the factors of the sustainability that is difficult to apply in Egypt? Because you know that there are many uh, factors that influence the sustainability, especially for the uh, infrastructure. Can you maybe share, is it the financial or the uh, legal aspect or other factors for the sustainability? And for Mr. Uh, sorry, Professor from the Uganda, uh, I, I didn't type the Dr. name, your name, but I have the question about um, wastewater treatment in Uganda. So, how big is the uh, government give um, what is it uh, support to? To make uh, wastewater treatment can be applied well in Uganda because, like in Indonesia, wastewater treatment is still not uh, running uh, maximal, or the enrichment for the wastewater offsite system is very low. So, how about uh, Uganda? Can you explain uh, more about that? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Mrs. Nadia. Dr. May. Uh, did you get the question clearly? Dr. May? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you may answer the question directly if you get the question uh, clearly. Hello, Dr. May. Yes. Yeah. Did you get the question? I'm, or should I, I I'm, repeat? I didn't get the question. I didn't get the point. OK. Uh, and I already, uh, please type your question. Yeah, for the first question. Because uh, an occur problem uh, through uh, her question, I couldn't hear uh, well. Yeah, actually, uh, for the first question, she asked about how much green infrastructure could minimize the disaster. I'm sorry? How much green infrastructure in Egypt, because you are talking about green infrastructure, right? Could minimize the disaster in your country. Is that correct, Nadia? Yeah. Is it a problem in writing you? For the first thing? question. But I will type it also in the check box for a second. Okay, yeah, I'm waiting for you. Yeah. Your question is historically how much green infrastructure could minimize the disaster in your country? Uh, uh, it's been 10 years since. Yes, I mean. Why you said that green much? The state cannot implement it and the sustainable reason can you explain? 
Both artifacts are also in the Philippines. Okay, uh, for the first question, how much green infrastructure could minimize? I, I think this question uh, should uh, uh, depend uh, uh, on uh, statistics and uh, software programs. It is difficult uh, to give you uh, uh, an answer uh, at this moment. Uh, I think it is <laughs> more <laughs> difficult to answer it uh, uh, now. Uh, for the second uh, question, uh, it has been 10 years uh, since Egyptian society. Okay. Uh, the problem here uh, is the awareness uh, in all uh, developing countries, uh, not only in Egypt, uh, but also in all developing countries, uh, the problem uh, is uh, awareness uh, between uh, us or among people or uh, citizens uh, in each country. Uh, and this is, is, uh, this is what we talk about in our last slide. Uh, we should uh, increase or raise uh, our awareness uh, with environmental education and uh, think green and do everything in a green way. Uh, this is the problem, I mean. Uh, I, I think 10 years is not enough. You are right. Uh, but we need uh, a lot of time uh, to implement uh, our uh, green infrastructure. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, for the second one, Dr. Semiaga. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Nadia. The question is clear on uh, the efforts of government to uh, increase wastewater coverage. As we said, wastewater coverage is less than 10% of the population in Uganda. Um, the, the government has put in effort, actually, uh, through its uh, state of body, that's National Water and Sewage Corporation in Uganda. They are extending, first of all, the sewage, uh, uh, sewage network uh, to um, uh, many parts of the city, uh, mainly Kampala uh, city, which is the capital. And they are adding on other nearby um, uh, uh, areas, towns, uh, to the treatment plant. And also they have increased the capacity of the treatment plant. There is a new wastewater treatment plant which has just been commissioned into operation. And this goes to over 45,000 um, um, cubic meter per day. So this will be able to um, increase the storage coverage because they, 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 they have a target of uh, reaching about 30% in the next less than 10 years. Of course, I know it's so it can be done in the next uh, 10 years because efforts are there uh, after having the new treatment plant and uh, after embarking on uh, extension of the, uh, of the sewer network. Uh, probably in the next 10 years, maybe it will increase to about 15% uh, about uh, uh, coverage. Still, this does not, uh, uh, it, it, it throws more light on uh, uh, on how it's not easy to have uh, a greater uh, storage network coverage because of the associated costs. So it means that we still have um, um, a long way to deal with uh, uh, non sewage sanitation. Though we are not saying that non sewage sanitation is bad, uh, it is just now to have efforts of improving also non sewage sanitation, which has also been done across the whole Uganda. The Kampala capital, the authority is doing a lot also in uh, having safe management uh, of uh, fecal sludge. And also another part of the minister's Minister of Water and Environment is doing also great work in improving the management of, um, uh, of fecal sludge from non sewage sanitation systems across the country. Uh, through um, uh, 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 putting money into design and construction of uh, uh, 
uh, fecal sludge treatment plants, which is even which has been ongoing and is still going on up to now. So, as I said, uh, that uh, uh, it cannot work a lot on wastewater. Even a lot has been put to uh, fecal sludge, so that uh, even where we have non sludge plantation, it can still be safe for the people. Hope this answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Samiaka. Hopefully that answered the question raised by uh, Nadia and also Dr. May. Unfortunately, actually, we are now approaching the end of this uh, plenary session. Uh, I do have some question on my notes, but we are going to pass to all the speakers uh, later on by email or by chat, and hopefully they still can respond to all the questions. So uh, once more, I'd like to thank for all the speakers. Dr. May is very pleased to see you today, even it's through online meeting, and Dr. Samiaga. And hopefully, we can see all of you uh, in the near future, hopefully next year, when we uh, held another conference. So thank you very much and all the participants for the interesting discussion and also uh, all your collaboration and also attention. I'll going back to the MC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Goodbye. All right, it's such an amazing material from Dr. Samiaga from Uganda, who already give the material regarding about fecal sludge management in urban slum of sub-Saharan Africa. Also, we thank you to Dr. Mai from Egypt for delivering such a cool material regarding green infrastructure, as well as big thanks to Mr. Mario from Italy, who already explained the material regarding the machine learning for health data science. We hope that all of this knowledge will be very useful for our future. Okay, uh, for the next, thank you. And to Mr. Muhammad Arif Budiharjo as the moderator, please can give the certificate for our speakers. There are Dr. Sumiaga from Uganda, Dr. May from Egypt, and Mr. Mario PhD from Italy. Thank you. All right, for Dr. Sumiaga, uh, please accept the certificate of appreciation from uh, from us uh, as a keynote speaker for the second international, international conference in on environment sustainability issues and community development in Semarang Indonesia thank you dr semiaga thank you so much uh, thanks so much for the opportunity of uh, uh, talking to this great audience. I'm honored and I'm available in case of anything. I think an email can be shared. I can uh, respond uh, to issues in involving uh, waste management, fecal sludge and wastewater. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shemega. We may contact you shortly. Don't worry. Yeah. For the next... Okay. Good yeah. Time. Thank you. Uh, okay. The next certificate is for Dr. May Sayed Fuad Abdul Aziz. Uh, this is a certificate of appreciation for being the keynote speaker uh, for the second international conference on environment sustainability issues and community development 2020. Dr. May, please accept the certificate and we are very honored to have you today. Thank you very much, Dr. May. Yeah. I think it is a technical problem uh, in your voice. Yeah, Dr. May. And some uh, people scramble the conservation. All right. Thank you, Dr. May. That's all right. I'm yeah, that's all right. And you may give uh, the last word that you want to say to us. Okay. Uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> In my presentation, uh, as the last uh, slide, 
I am looking forward to see uh, all of you uh, in Egypt to visit uh, Wadi Al uh, Hitam, which is one of the uh, UNESCO heritage sites in Fayoum Depression. Uh, and I'm looking also forward uh, to uh, joining uh, your uh, third international conference, which will be held uh, in Indonesia, inshallah. And uh, I will come to attend your conference, and uh, uh, hopefully, uh, I wish uh, your uh, conference uh, all of success uh, and uh, to be uh, fruitful. Uh, and uh, you give us uh, the feedback uh, or uh, some uh, records from this uh, conference, please. It's my pleasure uh, to uh, uh, accept this. Thank you for the certificate uh, and for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. May. And for the information, you may join to the rest of this conference because this conference will be held until... Uh, afternoon, so please welcome if you want to attend to the parallel session. Thank you very much, and I will return to the MC. Thank you. All right, thank you once again. Thank you for our keynote speaker who delivered the materials, and thanks to moderator for guiding the course of the material. The next program is break session. All participants may have a rest for the first 45 minutes. However, please kindly stay in this Zoom meeting and do not leave the meeting in order for the organizers to be easier in allocating you to the breakout room. Since after this, we're going to have a parallel sessions, so all participants may get back to the room again at 12.20 in Indonesian time or GMT plus seven. Okay, here we go. Let's take a break and stay with, stay with us. us.
Tick, tick, tick. Tick, tick. Tick, 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 tick.
Hello, welcome back with us. The next program is parallel sessions. To all participants, please enter the breakout room according to the division of the room that already been provided. And here we go, enjoy. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. Can you hear my voice? Yes. Yeah. Clear. Thank you. Yes, okay. Thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to first welcome to all of you yeah, to the parallel session 
of the second international conference on environment sustainability issues and community development or we call it in yeah, 2020 my name is Budi Prasetyo Samadikun yeah, you can call me Pak Budi yeah. today I'm as moderator for this parallel session and today's program is reflected in your program book but I will deliver more details yeah firstly there is opening parallel session by me yeah as a moderator secondly is oral presentation from its presenter lead by me yeah as a moderator and the last or shortly is closing for parallelization okay if you see the rules of parallelization in your screen or maybe i will read the rules of parallelization yeah yes please okay rules of parallelizations number one the presenter are required to register at registration form link okay don't forget to register at registration form link number two in the presentation session the participants are expected to do screen sharing using your laptop yeah if a problem occurs the presenter may contact the public relations team yeah we have public relations teams if you have a problem with your zoom you can be at the public relation team number three the participants are expected to turn off the microphone except the presentation session number four the time given to deliver the material is seven minutes and three minutes for a question and answer session number five i will remind you two minutes left for the presentation time number six during the presentation the presenter is required to turn off the camera on the device and the last or number seven in a question and a session participants are expected to send the question in room chat and then i will read the questions is there any question for the rules of parallel association no no questions you understand all of you understand or you understand okay now for the first presenter please welcome mrs honey mrs honey Vistanti, yeah. stmt with the paper title integration of Apollo anaerobic sluts blanket and construct for all the participants and Mr. Moderator. My name is Hani Visanti and I am representing my team to present our study, which is titled The Integration of Upload and Arabic Sludge Blanket and Constructed Wetlands for Pharmaceutical Waste Water Treatment. Uh, our study is based on the basic reason, uh, which is focused on the pharmaceutical industry, which is uh, 
the basic needs of human life and it is also the priority of the Indonesian government one of the top five so it is also it also gives a positive impact on the Indonesian economy however on the other side it will also give a negative impact in what in what terms it is in the in, uh, environmental terms in their operational the pharmaceutical industry uh, consumes a large volume of water so in equal they will also generate a large volume of wastewater basically their wastewater uh, has the characteristic of toxic and persistent contains persistent pollutants so without a proper treatment it will be dangerous it will be toxic and it will pose a high risk to the uh, aquatic ecosystem and also to the in human life if it is discharged without a proper treatment so uh, in answer to that problem the researchers have uh, applied uh, several technologies such as the flocculation, the coagulation, the flotation, the filtration, absorption, the zonation, the nanofiltration technology, reverse osmosis, and biological processes. Uh, this technology has been applied starting from the ranging scales, from the laboratory scale to the pilot scale. However, those uh, technologies have uh, surfaced a uh, uh, main problem which is the high investment cost and their low efficiency for removing dissolved pollutants as i have mentioned the technologies above they are mainly physical processes so they cannot remove the dissolved pollutants so in this study we are trying to find the the highly efficient technology but with cheap cost and a simple operation so in answer to that solution, we are trying to propose two technologies. One of them uh, is the anaerobic digestion. The anaerobic digestion is a long founded technology and it has been widely applied on various wastewater treatment in ranging scales, starting from the laboratory scale to the full scale. It is uh, reported as a highly effective technology for removing soluble pollutants and it is robust technology which can handle a high uh, loading rate best water. It also has been developed in various forms starting from their most conventional form which is uh, which we know as a septic tank to the most advanced form which has improved their uh, uh, retention times and their efficiency. And the second technology is the constructed wetlands, which uh, uh, a system that is uh, imitating the natural wetland. It is a simple process with a simple construction and a low cost maintenance. However, in this study, we are trying to integrate or we are trying to combine these two processes or these two technologies to achieve a, a maximum performance. Uh, each process are we use them to uh, cover their own drawbacks and to highlight their own advantages so in this study we use a, a upflow and aerobic sludge blanket reactor with uh, 5.2 liters of working volume and we used it to uh, uh, treat a real pharmaceutical wastewater treatment with a loading rate ranging from uh, 0.5 to 2 kilograms COD per cubic meter per day with an average retention time of 18 hours. Uh, for the second unit, uh, we use a two series of reactor with uh, 8.5 liters of working volume. This uh, constructed wetlands unit uh, use the type of horizontal subsurface flow constructed wetlands and we use three types of plants which are Tipa angustifolia, cypress papyrus, and heliconia. For the plants, we use a media, a gravel media for the planting media. And before using it for the pharmaceutical wastewater treatment, we uh, adapted. Uh, Excuse the me, unit. one minute more. Okay. Mrs. Uh, uh, this is the characteristic of the wastewater that we treat. 
uh, and the result is as follow. It is the performance of the USB reactor. And we can see that it is low and fluctuative in the initial, but it can recover and show a high efficiency in the end of the experiment. And for the performance of the constructive wetlands, we, uh, we observed that it was stable and high in the beginning, but it shows a drop in the middle of the experiment, but it also can recover in the end of the experiment. For the performance of the integration system or the combined system, it also shows a high performance system with a, an average uh, efficiency of 93 to 96%. So in conclusion, we uh, conclude that the integration of the USB and the constructible wetland was a promising potential to be used as an effective technology for pharmaceutical wastewater treatment with a high efficiency with, uh, and the anaerobic digestion is used as a as a pre-treatment because it is robust and able to reduce most pollutants, while the constructed wetland was able to remove the remaining pollutants and achieve a high quality effluent. Both technologies are simple processes with a cheap cost and highly efficient to be used as a wastewater treatment process. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay. Thank you very much to Mrs. Hani Vistanti. So, is there any response or question for Mrs. Hani? Everyone? Please. No question, please. Just turn off your turn on your mic, and you can ask Mrs. Any, anyone? No, no question, no response. Okay, maybe I can ask a question to. Mr. Hani, Mrs. Hani, I'm sorry. Uh, for how many uh, period you uh, do the research? Totally, how many time? Uh, we did the experiment for a total uh, maybe more than 30 days. So we did the acclimation period first before the, the experiment. The experiment total itself is about 25 days. Uh, but uh, the acclimation period for each unit uh, is different. For the uh, anaerobic digestion, uh, the acclimation is reached in about uh, seven days. While in the constructed wetlands, we did the acclimation period is uh, mainly we did it so uh, as a acclimation period and also a growth period. So we give the opportunity for the plant to adapt to the environment and also to uh, strengthen their root before we use them for the wastewater treatment. I think that is my answer. Okay, okay, Mr. Sani. Okay, complete answer. Thank you for your answer. Is there a question now from everyone? Okay, if there is no questions, thank you, Mrs. Hani, and let me continue to next presenter. Please welcome Mr. Muklis, STMT, yeah, with the paper title "Cost Optimization of Tannery Wastewater Treatment."
am from Lippi. For increase 2020, I will present our paper with the title Cost Optimization of Tannery Wastewater Treatment by Electrocoagulation Process with Iron Electrode under various DC voltage and electricity consumption. The background of our research is the tannery industry that has great potential adverse impact on the environment with produce large amount of wastewater water and without proper treatment it may endanger water body health and create a risk for human health through food chains. Electrocoagulation or EC is an electrochemical technique in wastewater treatment and that generate coagulant species in situ by electrode dissolution of the sacrificial electrode. It has many advantages like easy to operate with simple equipment, with small footprint, no sensitive chemical treatment and reduce the amount of generated sludge. Our study aim to examine the optimum operating cost of tannery wastewater treatment by easy with iron electrodes under various DC voltage and electricity consumption according to sedimentation performance assessment. Methodology The EC process was conducted under batch reactor with iron electrode with electrode space 26 mm and 400 mm raw tannery wash water and variable condition using three level of DC voltage 8, 12 and 16 volt DC and four level of energy consumption is this values based on our preliminary research data and Duplo experiments. The analysis data was conducted based on sedimentation curve using Imhoff and the data of electrode mass loss during the EC process. This is some pictures during the experiments. And this is the design of experiments using three level of voltage and four level of electricity consumption. And all was conducted with two run replication using the same electrode material. This is the schematic diagram of the EC cell. And this is the typical uh, Tannery wash water with the characteristics that exceed the effluent quality standard limit for tannery wash water in Indonesia. Result and discussion Electrode consumption Both replication of the experiments show the pattern of electrode consumption with good consistency. This higher energy consumption result in higher electrode consumption. And for the same energy consumption, higher voltage result in lower electrode mass loss. And the highest electrode consumption is the experiment at 4 DC E4, and the lowest is the 16 4 DC E1. And the current density was not a determining factor when the comparison was conducted under the same energy consumption. Imhoff cone sedimentation curve. Both replication of the experiment show the pattern of the setting performance with good consistency. The best three of the settling performance here is the we found the 12 4 DC E2 
640C E3 and 840C E1. While the worst is 840C E4. The result also show that the optimum coagulant doses from the iron electrode solutions plays an essential role in the separation performance. The operating cost equation was calculated based on the electrode consumption and electricity consumption. For the best three of the setting performance and the dual setting performance and as a function of iron price and electricity price. Both the operating cost versus electricity rate and versus iron, iron price is quite similar. We found that the, the worst settling performance 840CE4 has the highest operating cost while the best setting performance 1240CE2 has the lowest operating cost. Conclusion In this work, we found the optimum conditions for the EC treatment using iron sac sacrificial electrode for typical tannery wash water was obtained at the electrical voltage of 12 volt DC and the electrical consumption of 2.55 kilowatt hour per cubic meter and the operating cost of 0.45 to 0.55 US dollar. Okay, sorry for the uh, unconvenient. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the video presentation from Mr. Moklis. Is there any questions or respond, everyone, please? Is there any question? You can uh, ask to Mr. Moklis. No? No question? Oh, excuse me. Question from... Question from Mrs. Hani. Okay. There is a question from Mrs. Hani to Mr. Moklis. Yeah. Mr. Moklis, do you include the cost for handling sluts? Considering the sluts in category size, categories as hazardous, maybe you can explain. Uh, thank you, Miss Hani. Uh, uh, sluts uh, hand, such handling is also the cost that important. But uh, our research, we limit uh, in cost calculation only based on the our the the operating cost that uh, related to the electricity and uh, electrode uh, cost only for just for two to uh, to source of cost uh, electrode and uh, electricity 
um, uh, maybe next next time we will uh, explore more on uh, uh, the sludge handling tool. That's it. Okay, that's Thank all, you. Mr. Mokulis. Then how, how is is this any? Do you satisfy? Satisfy yeah, yeah. enough for the answer of Mr. Muklis? Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Is there any questions again? Everyone? No? Okay. If there is no questions, thank you very much to Mr. Muklis. Yeah, that's the presentation from video. Okay. And now I'm continues to next presenter. Uh, since uh, 80s, I think, I think, and also now, and uh, to next, and uh, secondly, related to human health effect, we know that aerosol like PM 2.5 uh, and PM 10 has had uh, had uh, standard limits. Uh, uh, in our countries, Indonesia and other countries. And we know that uh, World Health Organization has the standard limits on, on PM 2.5 and PM 10. But uh, related to human health effect, uh, which we can uh, relate to toxicology aspect, aspect, we know that human health effect cannot, uh, cannot associate it just with the the mass concentration which we use by the standard limits uh, right now 
we must know that uh, uh, other metrics like uh, um, number concentration, surface area concentration is related to human health effect. Then in number concentration, we know that finer particle is more than the uh, coarse par particles. Therefore, a nanoparticle which uh, size 100 nanome na nanometer can be have more human health effect and hazard dose uh, and hazard effect that we can imagine before. Therefore, we we do this uh, research to understanding uh, what is obtained in this in this area of research and what have been developed until now. Therefore, we use the bibliometric analysis in to analyze the development of research on exposure evolution of nano size particles in the breathing zone. I mean, in personal exposure. Okay, the methodology, we use Scopus as the database, database source, uh, and we use title, abstract, and keyword to search the, 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 the articles. And we use this, uh, the keyword, and then search, which we uh, limit for the English that use uh, in the article, and uh, also the the the, art the article. Just we just we use articles, and we download in GSV so uh, to to use in post fireware uh, this uh, this software to do the bibliometric analysis. I cannot. Uh, explain about uh, the, the force fire maybe in this presentation. Okay, but you can uh, search in this uh, address. Okay, I have three results. I, I hope I, I, I have uh, enough time. Firstly, I want to see us about the development of this research. Uh, this in the uh, blue, blue, we can see the number of publication, which I think in 2005 and 2006, the increase can be, can be liked, uh, can be like, and in cumulative, maybe in, in cumulative publication, we can see that uh, more, more clear. And this, the detail, which uh, more article in this uh, publication and very few in conference review. Okay. Uh, sorry, we have two minutes okay left. okay okay and the and then the second result uh, i just showed see the 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 result about uh, this maybe it is about the citation we can see this which upper duster g have more circle uh, they have uh the biggest citation but not just uh, we can know the, the 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 citation number but we can know the link of the citation i think i uh, and also donaldson as the second and etc but the important thing that i want to uh, share now is about i found the gap of this research by using the bibliometric analysis this i analyze the term on the uh, title and abstract and found three cluster that uh, can be uh, uh, conclude that in cluster one is the biggest. They talk about uh, the measurement or assessment of nano or ultrafine particle exposure that entered or inhaled in the breathing zone. And in the cluster two, they, they, they research, the cluster research is about the exposure response to many subjects. Uh, and the effect and the cluster C and uh, uh, is the the low the, the lowest is focused on the existence of nanoparticle and consumer product. By this cluster, we know that the development of this research is have in these three cluster. So I want to conclude my my presentation that first we know that the growing of this uh, publication on this research is uh, start from since ninety eight. T, 18, 80, 85, sorry, 85. And uh, they have start uh, in, in, in the big increase in 2005 or 2006. And for the conclusion, I have some finding that 
uh, I think uh, in my analysis, in our analysis, the greater depth of an appropriate device for exposure measurement, uh, which match with the metric have to be focused. And then uh, the three metric, mass concentration, number concentration, and surface area concentration are needed to be chosen or combined when the measurement performed. Therefore, if this can can doing so uh, the capabilities of analysis can improve for future in health nanoparticle exposure assessment that's all i'm sorry for the long time thank you very much thank you very much mr handika so to keep the time then we just go directly to the question is there any question for the participant you may raise your hand we still have two minutes because we already used the one minute for the last uh, presentation um, maybe no. I will ask the question. Oh. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what is the health effect for this nano particle for the exposure, especially for the breathing zone? There are like We can think that when the big particle in course like uh, uh, PM10 enter to our our body, they just maybe enter until our our nose maybe or may, maybe uh, until our lungs maybe lungs maybe. But in nanoparticle, they can go to the, our brain, they can go to our cell, they can go to many part of our body that it is can be imagined now now so uh, the the research talk that uh, the if effect of nanoparticle can be imagined that and it is make it is very important to to research and to control about the uh, pollutant of nanoparticles like that thank you maybe uh because the time is up but i will i'm very happy with the answer <laughs> okay so it's quite dangerous yeah? if it can enter our cells and brain we have to be careful with that uh, thank you mr handika for the presentation and for the answer and yeah i will move to the next presenter our third presenter is mr Taufik Ihsan. Uh, I'm sorry, but in my list, there are maybe some of the presenter uh, doesn't give the title. So I just read as the list in, in me from the committee. I'm sorry if uh, I may wrong for the title, but uh, for now, Mr. Taufik Ihsan, is going to uh, presenting the paper with the title of the effect of chlorophyllophos exposure on crabfish in twin lakes of West Sumatra, Indonesia. To Mr. Isan, please, uh, we give you seven minutes for the presentation. Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for the time given to me. I'm Taufik Isan from Department of Environmental Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, Universitas Andalas. We'll present the result of our research entitled The Effect of Chlorpyrifos Exposure on Carpfish in Twin Lakes of West Sumatra, Indonesia. As we know, chlorpyrifos is one type of insecticide that enters the water body. It will potentially pollute surface water to affect water biota, such as fish, 
and insecticide contamination in this body will damage the resp respiratory and nervous system of fish and affect the metabolic network of fish need oxygen as an energy source. And case in the twin lake area with Sumatra province, there was a runoff of the agricultural region in this area. It used a polar purifus to go to the carp cultivation area. And from previous research, Color purifus concentration at this spot is 0.007 ppm, and LC50 color purifus was 0.03 ppm. The study aimed to analyze the effect of sublethal toxicity of color purifus in carp also on parameter of oxygen consumption, feed conversion ratio, FCR, sustainable growth rate, SGR, and changes in the carp behavior. Now, let this we can see this map. Uh, this is Sumatra province. Here about 60, this is uh, Padang, the capital city of uh, Sumatra. 60 kilometers from Padang, there are twin lakes. In Bahasa, we can say is Danau Kembar. This lake is unique because there are two lakes. There are two lakes. And there was a runoff of the agricultural region in this area, in this lake, go to this area. In this, uh, in this another lake, there are a uh, carp cultivation area. So in the methodology, uh, we used uh, a glass-based tank as many as nine pieces, each of three tanks of control for concentration, one per seven of LC50 and one per 14 LC50 chlorpyrifos. And then there are test animals used in the study where carp with average size of four to five centimeters and two to three grams each uh, fish. There are total uh, 45 carps. The acclimatization of test animal was carried out for 14 days to give the test animal adaptability and 14 days for observation. The data on the and first, the four, seven, and ten, and the fourteen. FCR SGR were observed by measuring carb and feed load weight. Behavior observation by using a video camera. Also, uh, every day we're measuring GO, temperature, and pH. Uh, result and discussion. Uh, for result, this figure shows an increase. Increase in the FCR of carp exposed to chlorpyrifos uh, from uh, first to 14 days. The increase of cure in exposed to chlorpyrifos insecticide. Fish was exposed to chlorpyrifos, which inhibits metabolic process in the fish body. So that fish experienced stress and caused a high feed compression ratio in fish. The lower the fish FCR value, the better because the amount of feed spent to produce a certain weight will, will be less. And then we can see this figure. There was a decrease in the growth rate of carp exposed, exposed to chlorpyrifos insecticide, decreasing the SGR of cure due to the disruption of metabolic process in the fish body due to the damage to the respiratory and nervous system. This situation maybe was due to the function of the gills and the organ that were directly related to the kills in carp, which begin to experience damage due to insecticide contamination. So the gills cannot supply oxygen adequately in the body. And then for visual observation, mucus function to reduce body fraction, which water they could make fish swim faster and prevent the entry and exit of the water through the skin as a protector produce so that there was a mucus. For the body of living, things had a tolerance abilities that were not needed by the body. And for this variable, um, we can, uh, based on our research, statistically, it does, doesn't significantly influence the variation in the concentration and length exposure of chlorpyrifos. And finally, in conclusion, the length of the exposure time and the higher the concentration of exposure to cloud previous insecticide, the higher the feed conversion ratio and the highest concentration of 
4 ppm or 1 per 14 LC50, the ratio increased to 0 0.0, 0, 0, 0 0.3.01. Then the growth rate of carb is also getting lower. Time of exposure and variation in concentration and the changes in physical behavior of carb. Just general appearance, markers, and analysis. Okay, maybe that's all. Thanks to the Department of Environmental Engineering, Universitas Diponegoro, for running this international conference that we can publish our research. This is what I can present. Thank you, Ms. Diana. Thank you for the, all of your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you, Mr. Ivan. Um... Like on time, seven minutes, <laughs> and for all of you here, that uh, after this we have uh, a version, so we will choose one of the best presenter uh, or yeah <laughs> for its its room as the top three, and then we then uh, try to make a what is it in the smaller list. And then we get the winner, maybe like every room, but the rules, one of the rules is you have all I'm sorry, ma'am. Uh, I I'm can sorry. hear your voice. I'm sorry for really. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have trouble with my connection for a while. So uh, the rules, not only giving a good presentation, good uh, communication, but also you have to interact uh, with the other presenters. So it's very important for all of you to also participate in giving questions so we can give you a plus for the score. <laughs> so, okay. Um, Maybe this is uh, especially for the crab, yeah, for your 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 any uh, research. So, uh, is there any particular condition with the water? Like you show in the picture, there are so many other places with the same uh, maybe condition uh, with your uh, scope of research. So, uh, maybe you can share. Is there any like? particular condition that should uh, we have to make a good improvement or good uh, production in the crabs maybe how the COD or CO or you can share to us the quality the good quality that required okay thank you ma'am uh, because uh, in this leg uh, Some, some people in this lake uh, use this water uh, as a source to drinking water. And, and because of that, uh, in Indonesia, we know uh, based on uh, regulation, uh, there are class one for if we want, if we want to uh, use as drinking water. And from our uh, another research, uh, Based on class one, this uh, leg is uh, class two. So, uh, we, uh, so I think it's it's it is it is describe how the parameters in this leg. Maybe that's maybe I can say it's uh, ma'am. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh,
we said it is crucial because the the microbiome uh, microbiome or native bacteria uh, have uh, can uh, turn around the detrimental effect in less water and and uh, how to say it in in, in english uh, I thought it is a crucial uh, aspect because we must know that the, uh, the characteristic not only for the uh, algal but, all, but also the uh, what the consortia or the bacteria or uh, other uh, co culture organism that we use. Okay, thank you very much for the answer. I think that's uh, that's already answering the question. Uh, I would like to move to the next presenter now. Presenter number, uh, wait a second. Presenter number nine is not available. So I would like to move to presenter number 11. about my research the title is simulation sediment transport in development location of diesel power plant using computational fluid dynamic methods okay sediment transport is a natural process in coastal due to wave and current activity it can be longshore and crossshore sediment transport the continuously of sediment transport will have impact on the image of construction around the coastal due to erosion and accretion on the other hand, Halmahera is the location of PLTD construction. The diesel power plant needs a huge water consumption for its cooling system. The lack of the water consum the lack of the water recent diesel power plant to work difficultly. The purpose of this simulation is to determine the right direction and amount of sediment transport in the development location of construction Halmahera diesel power plant with, marti with particle mass flow rate variation. Okay, in this simulation, the research is validated with uh, Terpakau and Pantokratas with uh, Lagrangian discrete based model. The result of the journal validation with maximum error 14.63% error value. In this simulation, the modeling area is located in Halmahera, North Maluku province. In this picture, the black line is a domain computational in bathymetric maps. The bathymetric map used to illustrate the type of the sea and the line boundaries. The current value in Halmahera water ranges between 0 until 0 0.55 meter per second with a maximum value located at a depth of 2 meter based on measurement in November 2017. The current data used in the simulation is north direction current with a maximum current value of 0 0.4 meter per second. The geometry modeling was using solid work based on the bathymetric map of the water of Halmahera. Geometry in this modeling consists of inlet, outlet, surface, beach, seabed, and ocean. In this simulation, set on steady state condition with turbulent car epsilon releasable and discrete based model, boundary condition used in the rate of erosion and accretion simulation refer to the result of journal validation. 
Okay, the material used in the simulation can be divided into fluid and solid material. The fluid is used seawater and the solid phase used sand particle. The properties of the material shown in the table. Okay, this is a figure show the particle mass concentration. The contour explains the pattern of sediment distribution in Halmahera waters, which is dominated toward the north according to the data from the analysis condition of Halmahera water in 2017. The sediment concentration in the area around the inlet is higher compared to the surrounding area outlet. This condition because the particle velocity in the vicinity of the inlet is lower than the particle velocity in the outlet as the study of Udatama et al. The fluent simulation saw the same contour on each particle variable in the form of erosion and accretion point due to collision of the sand particle after crossing the seabed wall. In this simulation, the variation of particle mass flow rate is uh, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.2, and 0 0.25 kg per second with input speed equal 0 0.5 meter per second. The more particle inject, the higher concentration of particle in the water flow, which make the frequency of particle collide with the wall of the seabed increase. Based on the result of the simulation, we can predict the rate of erosion and accretion in millimeter per unit. The relationship between the particle mass flow rate with the rate of erosion and accretion is directly proportional. It can be seen the rate of erosion and accretion in the graph where the highest particle mass flow rate of 0 0.25 kg per second result in the highest rate of erosion and accretion. When the particle mass flow rate is high, the particle mass flow rate which will approach the velocity of the fluid. The graph in the figure has the same graph trend as Kusuma and Utomo research. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the simulation has conclusion. One, sediment concentration in the area around the inlet are higher than the area around the outlet. By the data, we know that amount of particle mass flow rate is linear to the amount of erosion and accretion rate which caused by sediment transport. And the last, predicting the amount of sediment transport in Halmahera can use the consideration development location of construction Halmahera diesel power plant, so it can be worked properly. Okay, this is the reference. Thank you uh, for your attention. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dimas, for your presentation. I think this is quite an uh, interesting uh, topic. Sorry for my background noise. Uh, is there any question from the participants? Please uh, don't hesitate to, to type the questions in the chat box. Okay, I think while we are waiting the questions from the participants, I can ask a question to Dimas. So my question is, why did you choose using computational fluid dynamic method? Okay. And is and is there and is there any other methods that you can use to do this uh, research? Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you for this question. Uh, I'm choose the computational fluid dynamic LCFD method because I think that uh, the method can predict uh, for uh, I for the future of uh, condition in location of diesel power plant. That's it. With the computational fluid dynamic, we can predict uh, one year, two year, and so on. Okay. Uh, is, is your research can be applied as well in other coastal areas in Indonesia? I mean, your method. So you, you're now doing your research in Halmahera, right? Uh, 
you reply to this question? So yeah, so you are not doing your research in Halmahera coastal area, is that uh, right? No, yeah. no. Uh, I'm I'm getting data from the my lecture, uh, and my lecture can simulate me the the sediment transfer, uh, the predict sediment transfer in Halmahera. Okay, okay. So yeah, yeah. Basically, this method can be used uh, as a universal method to other uh, coastal area. I mean, uh, yeah. other than the, the Halmai. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Agree. Okay. Uh, I think that will conclude your presentation session because there is no other questions from the participants. Uh, now I would like to move forward to the next presenter, presenter number 12. All right, well, uh, while my screen is loading up, uh, let me introduce myself. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nadia Dalayanti, and today I will um, present um, our paper. It's called Analyze Government Expenditure and Environmental Quality. Uh, we are using empirical study using provincial data levels in Indonesia. Um, we are uh, we, we are uh, Sandy Octavia, Octavia as the first um, writer, and then Andrian Stiadarima, and then the third one is Inda Fajarini Suwaiminro, and myself, Nadia Damayati. Um, I would like to divide my presentation into four categories. The first one is introduction, and then the second one is method, the third one is research and discussion, and the last one is conclusion. Um, to start with, I like to um, uh, make an introduction about my about our research. First of all, um, Economic, we, we are both, all of us are uh, from economic development. Um, so we studied about this and then eco economic development followed by production activities, um, mainly such as processing inputs uh, or production factors into outputs. And then uh, it is presumed to have an impact on the environment. And then the second one is Indonesian government started by improving through the local level. Um, regional government and then the regional government is given a mandate such as autonomy daerah uh, by the central government to allocate the regional revenue and then expenditure budget or as we call it APBD to overcome damage and improve the environmental quality of the respective regions economic growth is one indicator of a country's economic efficiency which is measured by gross domestic product I'm sorry about the over the GDP and the GDP per capita. And then high economic growth indicates an increase in a country's ability to produce goods and services and in turn causes an increase in the country's output and income, according to Totero and Smith in 2003. The problem regarding that uh, environment pollution occurs in many provinces in Indonesia and also the decline in the quality of the environment, the budget allocated specifically for the environment has not been maximized. The AKC, uh, its uh, environment Kuznet curve hypothesis is carried out using the quadratic function. Uh, e EID uh, equals uh, beta i plus beta one x i t plus beta two x i t two and before y i t plus standard er error with 
uh, the following terms of theta 2 uh, unequal with 0. If the 2 is less than 0, then forms an impartial curve EKC according to Yandel Petra in Fijaya Lab 1 in 2004. Whereas if theta 2 uh, more than 0, then forms a U curve. So the curve is um, like U letter. However, the study itself uses the IKLH variable whose behavior is offset to the environmental degradation variable, such as pollution and emissions as used in the EKC type cases. So that the results of the study are empirical, able to show that EKC behavior in Indonesia with a U-shaped curve because it uses environment quality variables. And then the second one is the methods. Uh, we are using uh, analysis model use is a panel data econometric regression model. And the analysis of the study is tested using three approaches, namely common effect model, fixed effects model, and random effect model. Panels were conducted in 34 provinces in Indonesia during the period of 2011 to 2016. The common effect model or poorly square PLS approach uh, is the simplest panel data model approach because it only combines time series and cross-section data. And that's the easiest that you can that we can um, do, that we can reach. And then the fixed effect model FAM approach assumes that regression equation has constant slope while the intercept varies between individuals. Whereas in REM, the intercept is considered a random variable that has an average value. The intercept is not assumed to be constant. So this random model is popularly known as the error component model, according to the Jada the in 2009. And then this is our two empirical models and equation models. Uh, it's uh, EQI, um, Environment Quality Index, uh, equals to theta zero plus theta one GTRB cross domestic regional brutal. And GE is um, government expenditure, and then GDRB square, and then standard error. And then on the equation model, there's uh, logarithma EQI equals to B0, and then logarithma GDRB, and then log logarithma GE, and then logarithma GDRB square, and then still using uh, standard error. Uh, as you can see, this. Um, two tables. Uh, the first table is redundant effects of fixed effects test, and then the second table is estimation, estimation result. Uh, the, first, the first table, it says the result of the redundant uh, fixed effects or likelihood ratio, and then the appropriate taste test for, um, for this research is fixed effect. Two minutes uh, left. Fix, okay, fixed effect model. Um, and then the preferred test is FAM over REM and common effect methods using assumption that the regression equation has a constant slope while the intersection varies between individuals. And then um, on the estimation, estimation result, uh, as you can see there, uh, the coefficient uh, here is positive. So um, if if there's like um, the results are positive, so every 1% of increasement for each variable here, um, there is uh, also increase in the environmental quality. And then um, uh, I would like to wrap it up in conclusion. This study finds that government spending and aggregate output in Indonesia have a positive and significant effect on environmental quality. The direction of development or sustainable development is increasingly become evident in Indonesia. This good signal needs to be pursued continuously by increasing production activities that are environmentally friendly, so that the increase in aggregate output will be in line with the improvement of the environment in Indonesia. Apart from that, the government spending is also allocated by considering the quality of the environment. Policies in public spending and development are implemented with due regard to environmental quality. 
the novelty of this research is the use of environmental quality indicators in analyzing the relationship between environmental variables and economic activities, which is chosen to represent the model. In addition, this study analyzed local government expenditure variables in Indonesia to represent government spending nationally. This study has uh, this has also a limitation that the government spending variable does not specifically represent expenditure in the environmental sector. So it is suggested that for the future research, government spending can be analyzed in more detail. Thank you. I will return to Ms. Moderator. Thank you very much, Santi. Uh, this is really interesting topic, I would say. Uh, please, anyone, uh, participants, if you have any questions for Santi, uh, can type questions in the chat box and I will read it to the presenter. We still have two minutes. Okay, I think I still don't receive any questions from the participants. So I think I would like to ask, ask a question to you. Yes. So in, in your current research, I know that you are not analyzing specific uh, government spending. Yes. So can you elaborate more what kind of government spending that you analyze, analyze in your research? So government spending in, uh, usually in Indonesia, government spending um, can be concluded into um, when you pay, um, paying, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, buying, buying, and then paying, and then uh, doing, uh, what is it? Um, the other, the taxes, substitution, uh, not substitution, I'm so sorry. Uh, subsidy. So uh, government can give subsidy to um, people. That is also for uh, government spending. And then when government um, uh, pay uh, the um, civil servant, that is also called uh, government spending as well in this country. So. Um, I think that's why it's not, um, there is a, it's not anomaly, but it's like a caveat that we should um, understand and um, research in the future about that because it's not necessarily um, related to environment quality. That's it, I think. Okay, thank you very much, Shanti, for your answers. Uh, then I would like to move to the next. Uh, Presentation? Yes, I can see your presentation clearly. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. My research with a member, Ms. Nurandani Hadianti, Mr. Budi Prastio Samadikun, Maya Esra Stefani, and Mr. Purwono. This uh, title it's a conversion of municipal solid waste to refuse derivative fuel using bank drain. The background, uh, background of uh, my research is sorry.
The municipal solid waste or MSW was not used uh, at all and decomposed naturally in the landfill. And the second problem is MSW is proven energy resource because solid waste uh, contains sufficient energy or heat as a substitute for fuel. And the uh, cap of uh, my research, uh, which uh, previous research before, with, uh, like uh, by Pamungkas and Hairunisa, that uh, have been studied uh, MSW as a mixture of paving block material uh, substitute for fine cricket. Paving block meets the quality criteria B and then can be used for car parking space. And so the second is uh, research by Alam, Octavi, uh, Octiawan, and Wadana planning to use the solid waste of Panyumurit landfill to be processed into organic fertilizer and plastic recycling. Uh, however, this is uh, has not been realized in the field. This is uh, a sample of uh, my research camp. Many, uh, some more uh, research camp I found from uh, previous research. And the aim of uh, the research is uh, to convert solid waste from Banyu Uri landfill to RDF using biodying and can be used for uh, cement industry, metal industry, and paper industry. The methods for uh, research is uh, the first is experimental setup, where uh, municipal solid waste sample uh, originating from the Banyu Uri landfill. Uh, Maglang Regency with a uh, composition uh, uh, found that uh, volume by volume uh, 38.60% uh, food waste, 15.24% uh, leaf waste, 24.63% plastic waste, and 21.53% uh, as uh, paper waste. So uh, then the waste uh, put into reactor, with, uh, namely bioreactor uh, control and biotearing reactor. Whereas uh, the biotearing reactor was applied with uh, air flow rate uh, about uh, six liter per minute, while the control is uh, was not aerated. And then uh, the second step is uh, the analysis from the data where uh, the temperature was uh, measured using temperature every day at 6 o'clock p.m. to o'clock p.m. and uh, 10 p.m. for 21 days. And then uh, water content was measured daily using the graphimetric method and caloric uh, value was measured on the first day, uh, especially in peak temperature in uh, 7, 40, and 20 Day. caloric value uh, testing use uh, from calorie meter. And then uh, from uh, leachage uh, quality, we have form, but uh, uh, the results saw that uh, no uh, produce uh, leachage. And the result and from this research, the temperature, uh, highest temperature are, uh, in thermophilic condition uh, happened in third day with uh, 49 degrees Celsius uh, for uh, reactor control and 60 degrees Celsius for uh, biotearing reactor. And the results uh, according with the previous research which states uh, that temperature different in the uh, reactor caused by different airflow rate. But uh, in this uh, research, only one flow with uh, uh, optimum condition from the previous uh, research in uh, six liter per minute. And uh, the temperature uh, in its reactor it has decreased after passing the peak uh, temperature, like in the figure below, yeah. uh, until it's uh, mesophilic uh, condition or, or mesophilic phase. And the uh, water content 
uh, in first day the con uh, in reactor controller decrease uh, by 4.10 percent and the uh, reactor decrease uh, by 5.75 percent and the lowest water content was achieved on 21 day the water content uh, in uh, reactor control was decreased uh, from 59.90% to 47.85% and then uh, in biotering reactor uh, decreased from 62.47% uh, to 32 0.65 percent and the uh, caloric uh, value in uh, two minutes left after control yeah, yeah in the first day the metric is control uh, about uh, five uh, oh sorry four thousand uh, five hundred and twenty point sixty one calorie per kilogram where is a uh, increase about uh, 1.5% when a peak temperature in such day. And the uh, uh, end of day, 21, the calorie control uh, has uh, increased uh, about 4.43%. Uh, and uh, from biotering reactor, uh, on the first day, caloric uh, about, uh, about, uh, Four thousand uh, fifty hundred and uh, forty seven point seven three calorie per gram, and then uh, caloric value increase in the peak uh, temperature temperature uh, about uh, six point eighty six percent, and the uh, end of this and this uh, process, the caloric value will uh, is uh, thirty four point. 19%. And the uh, final RDF caloric value is uh, 5,102.82 uh, calorie per gram. This caloric value is uh, equivalent with uh, low energy coal or brown coal. So, and then uh, RDF from Banyong Morib uh, Landfill McLean Regency can apply to cement industry where uh, requires it more than uh, 60,000 calorie per gram. Uh, PLTU requires uh, 50, about 50,000 calorie per gram and metal industry requires uh, same with uh, cement industry. And the paper industry is, uh, requires uh, five, uh, more than 5,000 calorie per gram to produce this. And the conclusion of uh, this research, this uh, bio drying process takes place uh, aerobic. It's uh, produced maximum temperature of uh, 60 degrees Celsius, which uh, generated from the bio drying reactor on the day. And the water content of solid waste metric uh, in the uh, end of day, the process is 32.65%. Uh, and the bio drying process succeeds in converting municipal solid waste into RDF with a final caloric value of uh, until 6,000 uh, more. Uh, RDF from Banyurip uh, can apply to the cement industry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Bapak Badrusaman, for the presentations. I think this is also an interesting topic. So I would like to encourage the participants to ask questions to the, present, to the presenter. We still have one minute for Q&A session. If there is no question, I think I can also ask a question uh, to Bapak Badrus. So uh, my question is, uh, on your research, you mentioned that uh, the current RDF value is equal to low uh, quality of coal. Do you have any ideas to increase this RDF value in, in practice? Yes, uh, I still uh, this research to increase the value 
uh, but it's enough to produce like uh, this uh, equal with uh, low carbon or pro coal. So it's uh, I think it's enough for uh, some produce uh, uh, to use for some industry like. Okay. Uh, Okay, thank you very much for the answer, uh, Badrus. I think it also concludes your presentation. and um, the result of my research in the field of uh, green technology with the entitled Technology and Economic Analysis of Urban Waste Potential Case Study of Chetibarek Gelpit Dam. Okay, let's move to introduction. Okay, uh, as we know, yeah, Indonesian government target by Ministry of Energy and Mineral or SDMs to increase the electricity production by 2025 to reach 700 uh, 200 megawatt. The government's uh, strong determination to suppress fossil-based yeah, energy from year to year encourages a massive increase in renewable energy power plants, which will target a mix of 23% by 2025. Okay. The second point is waste power plant is a thermal uh, with a supercritical steam and fuel by garbage or garbage methane gas. Okay, garbage methane gas are burned. Yeah, to produce uh, heat which heats the steam in a supercritical steam boiler. The high compression steams uh, drift the steam turbines and flywheel, which uh, connected to the generator by transmission gears uh, as intermediate to produce electricity. The power generates of this plant varies between uh, 500 kilowatt to 10 megawatt. If we compare uh, with this coal fire power plant, uh, power, pl uh, power of 40 megawatts uh, to 100 megawatts per unit, or nuclear power plant actually uh, 300 megawatt to 1,100 to 2,200 uh, megawatt per unit. Okay. At the end uh, to this research, we also implement a solid waste power plant uh, using uh, organic digester plan. So uh, this, this is our purpose research. Uh, the scenario use uh, this research to design a power plan yeah, that can be used to control increase the volume of waste. So at the uh, waste power plan, the organic waste is fed into the digester tank where it's converted into methane by bacteria. And the gas is uh, is then sent uh, to the waste power plant, which generates 0 0.9 megawatt. Okay, this map uh, of the location, yeah, our our research, yeah. So you can see that uh, the coordinate. Okay. Okay, we move to theoretical background. Landfill gas or LFG. LFG. What is that? Uh, LFG is a side product uh, of the decomposition process of a landfill. LFG consists of 50% methane, 50% CO2, and less than one non-methane organic compound, or NCMOS. LFG must be controlled and managed properly because if it's not done, it can cause uh, smoke, SMG. What's that? Smoke is poisonous, poisonous gas, uh, global warming, and can trigger can trigger a gas explosions, uh, explosions. So the sanitary landfill system is carried out by putting garbage into the hole and flatten it and compact, uh, then covered with loose soil. Okay. So this is a formula. Formula is total solid TS. What is that? Total solids or dissolved solid plus suspend and suitable solids in water. 
the equation PS equal then 27.7 percent percent multiple by Q volatile solid or VS volatile solids or the substance can easily transform from its solid phase to its vapor phase without going through a liquid phase VS equal 74.1 percent multiplied by multi by TS VPS VPS is volume of biogas produced per day VPS equal uh, 0 0.67 multiple by VS uh, so, uh, and then next VGM volume methane gas VGM 50% multiple by VPS energy energy is potential energy produced yeah the equation is VGM multiple by factor correction or 11 points uh, 17 kilowatt hour and power power generated by biogas plant is energy generated per day divided by 24 hours yeah okay so we're going move uh, to result and discussion uh, so the production methane gas vgm on 2020 uh, we obtain uh, as the equation we obtain uh, 337.5 cubic meter per day and if we calculate if we calculate the potential electrical energy produce uh, 3.7 thousand kilowatt hour per day and the power generated by the biogas power 0 0.157 megawatt and the selling price to PLN around 4.1 million rupiah okay the production of methane gas uh, on 2021 vgm uh, 375 cubic meter per day and if we calculate the potential for energy produce 4.1 thousand kilowatt hour per day and the power generated by the biogas plant uh, 0 0.174 megawatt and selling price pln around 4.6 million rupiah per day okay so you can see uh, in on 2022 and you can see uh, 2023 okay. selling price per day around 4.9 uh, million per day okay. so uh using the data from calculation it can be concluded that a power plant can be designed and built in jatibarang landfill to reduce the volume of waste the design waste uh, to energy plant can be the renewable power generator so you can see that this is a uh, sorry your, your time is over Pak Dennis. Okay, you okay. can wrap up your presentation okay this is my component then and this is conclusion yeah so the choosing to use waste to energy plants depend on the type of waste that's being burned so the utilization can be very optimized so this is my conclusion okay i think enough thank you thank you very much uh pak dennis for your presentation okay so now i will move forward to the part other participants are there any questions for Pak Dennis. Please feel free to type your questions in the chat box. We still have uh, minutes more for the Q&A session. Yeah, so there is a question from Shanti. What is the obstacle to apply waste energy in Indonesia? Uh, yeah. Part, yes, yeah. yeah, obstacle, obstacle, renewable Indonesia. It's, uh, I think, about the regulation, yeah, regulation PLN, regulation PLN, yeah, PLN to uh, uh, selling price PLN. So, yeah, I think. I think regulation. I think regulation. Mm -hmm. Regulation. If we if we uh, refuse uh, regulation, may uh, people uh, can develop 
Renewable Energy in Indonesia. Okay, uh, thanks for your answer, Pak Dennis. Is there any follow-up question, Santi? Or was it already answering your question? Okay, I think so. Can, uh, it can discharge. Uh, it is about uh, 15. Eh, sorry, uh, yeah, 14.6 uh, kilovolt. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the answer. Thank you. <coughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Is there any questions from the other presenters or other participants? Okay, so if we don't have the other questions, thank you, Mr. Hadda Afrizal, for the presentations. Good luck for your next, uh, for your future research. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, to the next presenter is Mr. John B. Nyomukiz. And, I'm sorry, Nyomukiza or Nyomukiz, because we have different names here, but I think this is you. <laughs> bibliography about myself yeah i obtained bachelor's in civil engineering then obtained the master's in civil engineering in 2019 okay wait i'm sharing Okay, uh, my research title is Recent Advances in the Stabilization of Expansive Soils Using Waste Materials. This is a narrative review. Yeah, my presentation overview, I will begin with brief introduction, then need for the study, discuss a little about expansive soil stabilization, then I will try to discuss about waste tires, sawdust and sawdust ash, fry ash. Then I discuss about some limitations in the field application of these wastes. Then I identified some research gaps. Then I will conclude and recommend for future studies. Yeah, introduction. It is known that some soils that are capable of supporting loads in natural and saturated state are observed to either expand or collapse when wet. These soils do not conform to the classical theories of soil mechanics and geotechnical engineering. Actually, this is the problem which, is, which occurs when constructions are built on expansive soils, more especially when they are wet, they expand and when they are dry, they start to crack. And the solution is to stabilize. There are different ways of stabilizing soils. 
they can be stabilized using chemicals or stabilizing using material wastes. So this review attempts to use wastes yeah, to carry out a review to see how waste can stabilize expansive soils. Yeah, if we consider the number of wastes that are produced, they could be used for various purposes, including soil stabilization. Yeah, if at all they are not used, they end up in landfills. And if at all they go to landfills, they just impose some pressures to the landfills, or as others are exposed to the environment and treated, that means they impose their, uh, they provide risks to the environment and to the human, human beings. So in case to use these, uh, to reuse these wastes, you can just use them by stabilizing the soils or use them for other purposes. The need for the study. The volumetric changes with the change of atmospheric conditions make expansive soils problematic to civil engineering structures. So this study will help to assess the performance of stabilized soil using waste materials. The work could give the geotechnical engineers and independent researchers an insight into the recent stabilization trends that could lead to sustainable development. Then I talk about expansive soil stabilization. Yeah, what's soil, st soil stabilization? Soil stabilization could be defined as a chemical treatment or physical treatment that increase or maintain the stability of, uh, stability of soil to improve on its engineering properties. This definition was adopted from Patel 2019. And the reason of stabilizing is to increase the physical and chemical properties of the soils. Yeah, if I tell you increase the physical properties of the soils, that means you are increasing or improving on the workability of those soils. And another thing, uh, there are different ways of stabilization. You can either use physical, chemical stabilization. The physical involves compacting, then chemical involves use of cement, bitumen, fly ash, and other chemicals, other stabilizers that are pozoranic in nature. Then you can also use waste materials. Some of the waste materials like fly ash possess some simultaneous properties. And if at all you use the waste, then that means you are using on the costs of the project. And also you are trying to uh, reduce on the problems that these wastes impose on the environment. That is soil waste management. Then another importance of soil stabilization is to improve on the strength properties. Let me just try to wind up. Yeah, waste tires, the disposal of waste tires has been a challenge throughout the globe and continues to be a challenge. According to the researches which have been conducted, it shows that waste tires have some desirable properties uh, like good vibration, low unit weight and earthy pressure. Yeah, the researches which were conducted about the use of tires to stabilize soil shows some improvement in the soils, like the research which was conducted by Rio 2020. And it also increased and confined compressive strength. Then it also increased bearing capacity of the soil. But all the researches which were conducted, it was derived that more gaps are still there, more knowledge gap, because there is no optimum content of waste tire that can use to effectively stabilize soils. Then I talk about sawdust and sawdust ash. This is an, a picture of sawdust. Then this is how sawdust can help to improve on the, uh, on the strength of the soil. Sawdust, uh, the particles of sawdust, which are larger than the soil is, can act as the, um, they can act as the shield to the soil, the soft uh, particles of the soil. Then those ones which, act, which are smaller can work as the filler for the soil. This is the mechanism for soil stabilization using sawdust. These are the optimum quantities which were obtained by some of the researchers. It was observed that 
3% was got in two papers, which I reviewed. Then another one got something like 7.5, another one had six. Yeah, these are some of the results from the previous studies. The research which was conducted by Miyamukiza showed I'm that- I'm sorry, the time is up. Okay, and let so, me just yeah, you can show conclude. you some of the research. Yeah, or yeah? you can conclude. Yeah, you can conclude. What? Okay, let me just show you some limitations okay. because this is something very important. Yeah, these wastes have not been utilized in the field because of some challenges, because there are no clearly documented guidelines by the government bodies regarding to the usage of these wastes. That's why most of these wastes are not used in the field. In practical, like in laboratories, they provide good results, but most of them are not applied in the field. So there is also no clear standard or optimum quantity of wastes documented. There is also inadequate data published by independent researchers, organization concerned uh, the use of these wastes. Then the research gap, uh, there is microstructure, studies on microstructure are still lacking. Then durability tests are also inadequate. These durability tests, when they are inadequate, you cannot actually know how long these wastes can take long when you use them to stabilize the soil. Is. So it's it's very important to conduct the durability test to know the performance of the waste since engineering projects are designed to last for long. Then there's also a gap about the economic analysis between the so-called well-established stabilizers and these waste materials. There is also a need to conduct research on them. Then the conclusion, yeah, I concluded my study by saying that these wastes improved the index properties uh, compaction characteristics and strength properties of the soils. The use of these wastes could reduce the number of waste discarded directed to the environment. This study emphasizes the field application of these wastes instead of focusing on laboratory studies only. Yeah, okay. thank you for okay, thank listening you. to me. Okay, yeah, thank you, Mr. Today, pay for tomorrow. Okay, thank, thank you. you, Mr. Neo Mukiza, for the presentations. So we only have a half minutes for Mr. Neo Mukiza. Please let me know if other of you have any questions. <clears throat> okay, is there any question to me, Mr. Neo Mukiza? Okay, I think it's the time is up for you, Mr. Niyomukiza. I'm sorry, it's already 10 minutes. Thank you for yes, the nice thank presentation. You very much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. so good luck for your next future research. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then we you. will have our last. Thank you for your opportunity today. So my presentation today 
title is Compression of Liquid and Mixed Waste Generated Electricity in Composite Waste Material to Cell. Actually, this research is uh, from 2019, but now, uh, today I present these, uh, these results, but it's, it's okay. So my affiliation is two. First is from the Department of Environmental Engineering and then and from GSTA, Yamaguchi University. Now I am in Japan. Okay. So from the introductions, I will I will tell about the energy scarcity. Uh, now is a big problem for light. And second, uh, many countries not not only many countries but also maybe humans activities, anthropogenic activities, use unrenewable energy. So it uh, have effect to CO2 emission, environmental harmful, and accelerating, accelerating climate change globally. Uh, we, we all know that the renewable energy source only maybe three, five percent use in this world. So I think it must be, it, it is the challenge to increase the use of renewable energy. So many scientists compete to find a renewable energy source producing high energy. Now, maybe the renewable energy source, the famous is solar cell. But for my research, I focus on the microbial fuel cells, which generating uh, electricity from the waste, or, or we can say waste to energy, uh, through the microbial metabolism. I will tell the process uh, concept. And then fifth, the variant of MFC adopting composting is CSMFC. I think it is new because most of microbial fuel cell is in anaerobic condition. But in my research, I focus on aerobic condition. I will tell after this. And then six, the use of CS CSMFC is producing electricity and also complying the compost result as the mature compost uh, as required in SNI 1970-30-2004. And then this is a big problem that uh, lower electrical generation uh, from solid phase, uh, that, is the, that is our challenge, uh, if uh, rather than liquid phase uh, waste, if we compare between liquid and solid, uh, liquid generate more electricity than solid phase. But for this study, I, uh, we will know all of uh, the, the comparison of uh, both liquid and solid. So this objective uh, study is comparing liquid represent uh, liquid phase and mixed phase represent solid phase, uh, solid waste. And then this is the literature process about the process I, I, I mentioned before. So this is the end of chamber. I will, I will tell after this also the, the, the reactor design. So this is one is the uh, waste. Uh, so I represent as the glucose. Glucose is a part of solid phase, uh, solid waste. Uh, if we, we we all know the molecular the molecular the molecular empirical uh, equation is maybe around C sixty eight up to C sixty eight hits hundred eleven. But for this uh, uh, review pro, uh, literature, I use the glucose. So the glucose will uh, uh, use oxygens. Two minutes left. Yes, one minute. Two minutes. Oh, two minutes. Okay, thank you. And then produce uh, carbon dioxide and uh, water and elect uh, electron and uh, proton. So the electron is the uh, potential of electricity. So after this, the electron will move to cathode chamber. So this is the electron will be kept uh, will be kept by the uh, electrode to produce electricity. Okay, I will continue. The material methods, this is the garbage we, uh, as a mixed waste. 
and then uh, proportion is 50-50 by weight over 0 0.61. And then uh, I use electrodes from the graphene and polyurethane and waste chamber is plastic wear. Then the electrogenic factory source is from Tanah Mas River sediment. So this is the research from uh, Indonesia. The first anode was placed at the base of the reactor. And then the second anode was placed in half of the reactor heat. And then the independent variable of the study is the material that are leached and mixed with. So the research procedure is from initial research, designing a reactor, and primary research. Result in discussion. So the initial research results uh, about the characterization mixed with from moisture content, C organic, and N total, T total, K total, and CN ratio, pH, and temperature. Graphene electrode characterization was 159 millivolt. Then microbial identification was identified as Escherichia coli, as a species categorized as Phylum proteobacteria. So this is the composting result. So after uh, 15 days, the composting will be major. So this is the point. So we will connect or relate with the electricity. So the after 20 days, the electricity from, we can see here, leachate and mixed waste. Leachate is produced from the mixed waste composting. So the leachate uh, will produce on 20 days more than mixed waste. But mixed waste produce electricity faster than uh, leachate. So for uh, application, it will, uh, very interesting for next research. This research configuration increased nine to 10 times than the other research, seven and 29. Conclusion. Okay, the time is up, Mr. Samudro. Okay, thank you so much for your opportunity. Thank you. This okay. Questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Samudro, for the presentations. Bye. Uh, so I'll be inviting the other presenters and participants to ask Mr. Samudro. Please raise your hands or you can write down your question on the chat column. Okay, is there any questions? Okay, Mr. Samudro, uh, I would yes. like to ask you, I'm sorry if my question is <laughs> a very simple question. No uh, problem. <laughs> so, so you are working with micro, uh, with uh, microbial, right? Yes, yes, yes. So, a part uh, of fuel cell is microbial fuel cell. Yeah. So how did you arrange the microbials as the variables? I mean... Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I focus for, for this study only for mixed waste as a solid uh, solid phase waste and then uh, liquid as a uh, liquid phase waste. Uh, so uh, I think that is the independent variable that I used for, for, for the research. But the in another independent variables I used, but I didn't mention for these uh, presentations. I only mentioned two kind of variables that uh, affecting most uh, most affecting the performance of CSMFC overall. Okay, so so, so this is so this uh, this uh, your presentation is a part of your whole studies, right? Yes, 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 yeah. yes. Okay, only one third. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. I think the time is yes. up. Thank you, Mr. Ganjar Samudro, yes. Oscar Samadesa. And... Okay, and then actually.
effort from various sectors to achieve social welfare. Opportunity in numerous sources that are well developed will be the main capital for development. B. There will be more qualified generation so that they can advance the regional economic sector. C. Human resources with super competent will be the driving force for development. D. Educational facilities, facilities and infrastructure as the main capital for human resources management must be fulfilled. Third, a mismanagement in overcoming the increase to produce the productive ex population. B lack of budget for human resources management. The conclusion obtained in the study are Central Java is experiencing a demographic bonus period until 2045, but has not been balanced with the preparation of competent human resources. B large population and abundant human resources a potential strength for Central Java. C Weakness in the population management system. If the abundant human resources is not balanced with adequate competence, it will be a demographic disaster. The availability of budget is an important asset to improve the quality of human resources. D. Taking advantage of the abundance of human resources must be balanced with the readiness of mature government. E. The last, if there if there is a human resources management error, it will become a burden from development in the future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's all the video from Ms. Yoni Blum, but actually from the committee information. Ms. Yoni Blum uh, actually in present in this room. So is there any question uh, to the presentation before you may ask uh, in the chat group after, uh, I mean, during the session. And after this, we can go directly to Mr. Mrs. Astrid Sunar Sunaryani as our 10th uh, presenter. So we have five more presenters left. Yay. Uh, okay, uh, Mrs. Nadia, can you hear my voice clearly? Yes, clear enough, thank you. Uh, Can you see the slide? Oh. Yes, already. Okay. I will start my presentation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today I would like to talk about our research, which entitled Persistence of Carbaryl. Um, sorry. Persistence of Carbaryl Pesticide in Environment Using System Dynamic Model. I am Asit Sunarani from Research Center for Limnology, Indonesian Institute of Sciences. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce you to the carbaryl. It is one of carbamate insecticide used throughout the world on about 125 uh, crops for the control of about 565 different species of pets. Carbaryl was preferred by farmer and has gained wide acceptance because of its low mammalian toxicity, less persistent in nature, and has been used as a substitute for some organochlorine pesticide. Although carbaryl do not persist in the environment, environment and the compound doesn't accumulate in mammals, there may still be short-term effect to the reproduction of aquatic organisms like freshwater snail, zebrafish, plankton, and fish. That's why we need to know about the fate of carbon in environment. The objective of this study was to formulate a model based on system dynamics to simulate a degradation process of carbon in environment. Since carbon was not really volatilized, so we only concerned about soil and water. So this is research, uh, this is consists of three major uh, steps. The first one is data collection. For data collection, uh, the second one is model analysis, and the third one is model validation. 
For data collection, we use data from previous studies, published data and literature information that has similarity in physical properties of soil and water like pH, uh, temperature, and soil moisture. Uh, a model for describe the persistence of carbon pesticide uh, was developed in the system dynamic uh, software using fencing PLE. And model validation was carried out by laboratory experiment using solid pest extraction, reverse pest high performance liquid chromatography for determination of carbon concentration. Then the value that obtained from model was compared to the experimental value uh, using mean absolute percentage uh, error test. Let me turn now to the result. Uh, this picture shows that the complete system dynamic model of carbon real. Uh, persistent environment, as we can see that there are four uh, stock or level, plant uptake, carbon in soil, microbial biomass, and carbon in water, and six process, carbon input, carbon release, uh, microbial growth, biodegradation in soil, desorption flow, and biodegradation in water. Uh, each process was influenced uh, by various uh, variables like dosage, spraying rate, area, dilution factor, and others. Oh, uh, carbon exists in soil was treated by microbial degradation and it reached surface uh, and groundwater as a result of runoff, desorption, and leaching. As well in as well as in soil, carbon can be removed from water through biodegradation. Now let's consider this model in detail. Each process has different and specific equation. We obtain the value from farmer interview, previous studies, literature review, and also by calculating. Uh, let's now look at the model prediction of carbon concentration in soil and water. The first feature show the decrease of total concentration of carbon in soil using 0 to 14 days as model boundaries since it has been reported that uh, the degradation of carbon mat insecticide in soil was occurred for maximal in two weeks. The result uh, revealed that uh, the application of carbaryl in the given condition, the complete elimination could be practically achieved after seven days. Uh, the other report showed that the half-life of carbon in soil varies from five days to 14 days depend on temperature, pH, soil moisture, and initial condition. The second figure show the model predict that carbon in water will be eliminated two days after entering the water body. Literature data on its half-life aquatic environment varied from one day to uh, six days. It was reported that the degradation of carbon in water depend on concentration of dissolved oxygen uh, that vary with season and locality. Uh, model validation was conducted using mean absolute percentage error test, MEPA test, can be useful for evaluating the accuracy of a prediction and indicates how much error in predicting compared with the real value. We can see from the table that the percentage of error uh, of experimental value and model prediction using MEPA test is 12.82% and it was acceptable because the error uh, value is uh, below 20%. This indicates that at the given condition, uh, the model can be used to estimate the percent of carbon pesticide in soil and water. In conclusion, we found that the persistence of carbon pesticide in environment has been predicted using system dynamic model. The half-life of carbon in soil was seven days after application and two days after entering water body. With 12.82% of percentage error compared to the experimental value, it can be concluded that the prediction uh, of developed model was acceptable and the model can be used to estimate the presence of carbon pesticide in soil and water. That's all of my presentation. Thank you for paying attention and thank you for Ms. Nadia for becoming a good moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nadia. Uh, Astrid. So uh, anyone who want to raise their hands? Um, question. It's very interesting on a small cute creature. 
can be very meaningful, yeah, Mr. Laskin. Okay, because actually our time uh, is already almost finished. I mean, the time from, from the parallel session. So uh, I will directly to the next presentation. Uh, is it okay, Ms. Astrid? Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, the next presentation. I'm sorry. Uh, can you uh, louder, please? I cannot hear your voice clearly. Oh, sorry. Um, hello. Do you already hear my voice clearly, Mrs. Nadia? A little bit more, maybe. Mm, okay. Uh, you have to. Uh, Hello. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Release your uh, emotion. <laughs> I'm sorry. So now it's good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Nadia, for the occasion. Good afternoon to the moderator and all the participants today. Uh, I would like to present my study about escalating the small-sized community green spaces role as the carbon storage in coastal town. Um, Basically, the main consideration of why this study did occur was because this study referred to the statement from Noor and Abdullah in their paper in 2019, which I quote here in point zero two that community green spaces type is frequently emphasized the aesthetic value than the ecological value that causes the medium level of ecological value within this type of green space, which from this statement, I assumed that the community green spaces type has the lesser dominated ecological value if it compares to the aesthetic value of the community green spaces type. So in order to escalate, to improve or to improve the ecological value of the community green spaces, this study would like to analyze the capability of the community green spaces type as the carbon storage, uh, a public space that stores the carbon within the coastal town or the urban area. So in order to attain, to achieve the purpose, uh, this study was, uh, this study was undertaken in Tanjung Pinang, a small coastal town in Riau Island, Indonesia. These two sites are the main location of the study. This is the site A and this is the site B. The difference between these sites are the location and the size of the area. Site one is located nearby at the sea, as you can see here at picture A. So from this, from here to here, See, this is the site one of the study called Taman Laman Bunda Tapilal Tanjung Pinang, the location nearby the sea while the site, while site two is located at downtown of Tanjung Pinang town. Site two called uh, Tanjung Pinang, site two is called as Ahmad Yani Pamedan, uh, Pamedan, Taman Pamedan Ahmad Yani. When site two um, has its size of 1.49 hectares or like 1498 kilometers square while site one the size area of site one is only 986 kilometer 
square or is equal as 0 0.98 hectares. So based on the size area, both sites are classified as small size park because the size of both areas, the both sites are less than 1.61 hectares. So based on the small size of each site, the total of sampling plots for this study is only between one to three plots with the adjustable size for each plot, adjustable to the actual condition in the field. Um, by the way, I forgot to mention the samples of this study. So this study, well, this study was identified all plants which has the more than 20 centimeters diameter at breast height size, like the diameter of plants is more than 20 centimeters. That's the sample of this study. Meanwhile, all plants with the si diameter size with less than 20 centimeters is disqualified. So the, the vegetation inventory was undertaken using the census method, which means this study was identified all samples within the sampling plots in both sites. And the, the, samples were, the samples were measured by the diameter and the total height of the trees, of each trees and the data that were obtained from the field, uh, field observation were uh, like, the, like the data of diameter and the total height of each tree were then further analyzed by using the formula from Chave et al. in order to obtain the estimation value of above ground tree biomass and then the above ground tree biomass value will further analyzed by using the formula from IPCC to obtain the information about the amount of carbon stock per species. So, I'm sorry. Um, the left side of this presentation is the indexes that this study already used to up to analyze the structure of the three species within both sites. Within both sites, there are diversity index, Simpson's dominance index, and species richness index. The result of this structure analysis will support the primary data of this study, which is the carbon stock of each species within both sites. One more minute. Okay, thank you. Um, for the structure, for the structure of tree community in site one, Terminalia mantali trees or Ketapang Kencana in local name dominates the tree community uh, cover area in site one, followed by Astonia scolaris or Pulai. Tabebuya aurea or Tabebuya kuning and Wodi Etia bifurcata as, or we, we call it as Palem ekor tupai in local. While in site two, Sweetenia macrophylla trees dominate the structure of tree community in site two, followed by Wodi Etia bifurcata, Terminalia katapa, and Austonia scolaris. And this table represents the amount of carbon stock per species in each site. As you can see that in site one, the top five species with highest amount of carbon stock of each species are as follows, like Terminalia mantali or Ketapang Kencana stores the, carbon, the highest amount of carbon stock in site one, followed by Astonis scolaris, Aurea bifurcata, Tabebuya aurea, katapa, and in site two, as you can see here, Sweetenia macrophylla trees store the highest amount of carbon stock, followed by Terminale katapa, Astonia scolaris, Sinama mumburmani, and Acacia auriculiformis. Based on the fam family of each species, as you can see that Combretase family, Apusinase, Bignoniase, Arecase, Laurase, and Fabase, and Meliase are those families that is that are capable of store 
the amount of carbon stock in capable of store the carbon stock in high amount. Well, there there is another previous studies that that studies the same or similar topic with this one, and the study also showed that species from Meliaceae, from Lauraceae, and from Fabaceae family are capable of store the carbon stock in highest amount, but with another different species with this one. So this is the this the, the table. This table represents some of basic characteristics of this top five species. As you can see here that these species have the same, have some similar similar things such as like the habitat that most species are really highly tolerant of drought condition and like content of nutrient matter in the soil and then they are highly tolerant to a condition that is lack of water as well. And from and this study assumed that since these species are ha, have such a great not 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 that not that great, but they have their capability to stay alive, to stay alive in those lack of content and water availability condition, then this study conclude that Sorry, that, your time is up. Oh, Can you I'm go sorry. to the conclusion? Okay, I'm sorry. The conclusion of this study is actually regardless of the the diameter size of each tree, the number of individual is the main driving factor of the high variability of carbon stocks amount per species. And from this study, Astonia scholaris, this study also found that Astonia scholaris and Terminalia catapa were capable of sequestering high amount of carbon stock in both mainland and both coastal habitat, and some species from Lauraceae, Fabaceae, and Meliaceae that are extremely tolerant of small mineral content, soil salinity, and lack of water content should be more developed inside one specifically. So thank you to the occasion, and thank you for today. Thank you, Mrs. Intan. Yeah. So I, let's check from the box. Are there any questions? Um, so actually, uh, I want to ask you about the uh, plants. Is there any correlation between the amount of the leaf of, of the I'm sorry of the leaf mm -hmm. to the ability from carbon absorption? So if, if we see from the picture which one is the higher uh, carbon absorption, oh. uh, it seems like there are so many like a big trees and mm -mm. a lot of uh, leaves. Is there any uh, correlation? Maybe you can co compare between the coastal plants or the mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, city plants. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, I'll try my best to explain it to you. Um, I, I'm afraid that analyze the physical features of leaf is one of the weakness of the study because, uh, not the weakness, but the limit, limitation of the study because this study didn't analyze the the leaf structures, the leaf physical, uh, physical, uh, the the leaf structural features, but based on some literatures that I've read before, actually, the correlation between leaf and the amount of carbon stock is relatively strong, but not as that, but not that strong. Not always strong, but not always weak as well. So, but based on the theory as well. Actually, the the you can call it like the color or like the leaf area index are two 
maybe two big important factors that affect the variability of the carbon stock that stores in each species. I've read that the bigger leaf it the bigger leaf it is, the bigger capability of that species to store the carbon stock within its body. But somehow the leaf area index is not the only factor that affect that contribute to the variability of amount of carbon stock. Some other factors like 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 I already mentioned before, like the number of individual trees or like um, the habitat uh, like where where this tree lives. Is it is it already fits or not fits with the basic the basic habitat of that species itself, or maybe another factor like uh, the maintenance of trees, maybe like the mulch, maybe like the the supply of mineral content in the soil, or like the watering, the, the, the regular watering that needs to be maintained in every single day to to keep the moisture of the trees itself and. I think uh, actually, uh, based on everything that I said, everything that I explained to you before, leaf is leaf has the correlation, but it's not. But that's not the only factor that contribute to the amount, like from the environmental factors and the like, from external and internal factor are contributing together in affecting the amount of carbon stock of each species, I think. But that needs a little further of studies to analyze that. And I hope that maybe for the next studies, that will be focused on that study, that will, fo that will be focused on that topic, especially if they want to start to, uh, start to take, uh, start to start the study with uh, in this same in the same place in the same location I okay miss intan thank you very mm -hmm. much for uh the answer and yeah. actually there are one question from miss, miss rizky andre handika and you can uh, answer on the chat box okay thank um, you. because we run out of time and into the uh, thank you very much once again for yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you Ms. Yeah. Ivy. and now i would like the environment. So I'm from uh, Faculty of Psychology, Universitas Negeri Jakarta. So today I would like to present about my work about um, whether gender, male or female in our age group affect how we feel about our sense of coherence. So what is sense coherence and what is the um, uh, psychology perspective on it? 
So I would like to discuss more on uh, my presentation. Okay, so I will start with the um, some information. So natural disaster affect large number of people across the world. Uh, the uh, WHO data uh, show a dramatic increase in the number of uh, natural disaster uh, in the past five decades. And scientific reports uh, have ev evidence confirming that increase of trend uh, are mostly related to our activities. In particular to flood uh, in Indonesia, uh, our country listed as the third most vulnerable country to flooding in Asia, just below China and India, uh, and ranked seven in the world in terms of number of people affected by the surge. Um, our um, uh, data show that 30% of Indonesian natural disaster uh, is flood, including Semarang with the rob, I know for that because I come from Semarang as well. And then the uh, uh, and other kind, uh, other place uh, in Indonesia, in big cities, Jakarta, Surabaya, Semarang, Medan, are faced with recurring severe flooding every year due to uh, high density, massive construction, and poor drainage system. Um, like for example, on early this year, uh, the overnight heavy downpours co caused river banks uh, across Jakarta overload with flood waters inundating thousands of uh, houses and buildings, submerged hospital, local markets, airport and bus terminals, in the, including the presidential police complex. It forced the local authorities to cut the electricity and telecommunication line as the water reach as high as two meters in some numerous commercial and residential place. And more than um, 50 people reported dies and more than 400,000 people evacuated from their homes and estimated local uh, loss during the flood is more than five trillion. And um, uh, there's a number of uh, research out there um, uh, showing the negative impact or the severe impact of uh, disaster to our psychological condition. Uh, Existing studies in psychology and health-related field indicated that flood leading to numerous mental health issues, such as the uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, anxiety, uh, severe depression, and social um, distrust that would lead to individual social dysfunction. Inability to identify the psychological impact among flood survivors may cause serious psychosocial outbreak. Okay, so uh, nowadays uh, people, uh, the government have the, uh, the, the method uh, to respond to this recurring problem. Uh, so basically there are two strategies used by the government to uh, flood prevention, the structural and the non-structural approach. The structural uh, emphasis in technical mitigation using conventional engineering approaches such as building large scale embankment, dam, division of canals and river normalization. While the non-structural approach focus on developing regulation for land use and flood early warning system development. Unfortunately, both of these strategy were criticized for put too much emphasis on technical oriented uh, indicator that might not sufficient to prevent losses from a recurring hazard. The structural strategy might also not offer a full protection um, against the flood due to unpredictable rainfall pattern, which often creates a false sense of protection among population at risk and lead them to take less precautionary steps to adjust with the upcoming floods. The government report itself acknowledged the initiative has placed small attention to people, community, and psychological aspect to deal with the risk. So um, on my studies, I'm proposing the uh, salutogenic approach. Salutogenic approach is one of the uh, popular approach used in health sciences and psychology as well. Uh, this is related to how, um, so the model actually uh, derived from the model of health by Antonovsky. Um, it's quite a um, 
uh, wow, well, since 1988, this model denotes to people way of thinking that focus on desire for positive and optimal experiences uh, uh, built upon sense of coherence. So sense of coherence is the main uh, variable measured the uh, salutogenic approach. Um, people, with the, pe people with high sense of coherence have better chance to uh, seek meaning in life experience, including uh, during the, um, uh, the disaster. And uh, according to recent study, uh, SOC or sense of coherence encourages people to think that first, the risk, many, uh, the risk uh, they face, whether they are from internal or external sources, can be predicted and controlled. Number two, they have resources that are available for them to use to manage the risk. Number three, the risk is a challenge and worthy for time investment and involvement. So the link between sense of coherence uh, on psychological aspect for uh, managing in managing the risk or uh, the flood is very important. Uh, so this is the, the model that I'd like to propose um, in order to, to uh, manage the, uh, the impact of the risk or, or the flood uh, that nowadays is kind of a bit neglected by the, uh, by the, uh, the uh, government strategies uh, manage, uh, in, in terms of uh, flood mitigation risk. Okay. So my study uh, was conducted um, uh, by recruiting uh, 194 adults across Indonesia, uh, consisting 64% female and uh, the rest is uh, male. And I'm measuring um, the socio-demographic information in terms of uh, gender and age group. And also I'm using the sense of coherence scale and I'm using the uh, quantitative approach using factorial ANOVA to analyze the difference between three and two uh, different groups of uh, socio-demographic uh, characteristic, gender, male and female, and um, age group, young adult, mid-adult, and late adulthood. And I'm using for the two key post hoc analysis for uh, age, uh, variable as the uh, analysis showing uh, those variable that uh, significant um, on the analysis. So this is the um, the characteristic uh, um, table of the respondents. And sorry, but I think uh, there are less than one minute. Okay, okay. You wrap up. Okay, so basically the finding is uh, the marginal mean table showed that the SOC score was reported significantly different with the age group, means that uh, gender did not uh, associate significantly with the sense of coherence instead of the age group. So the finding uh, showed that um, the SOC is important theoretical framework. And it's important to consider age differences because this is the variable that um, uh, that, that evidence uh, significant in the analysis. So, in terms of how uh, the government managing their strategy on um, um, on handling the, the the flood, how they uh, develop a strategy a plan need to be considered about the uh, survive, uh, survivors age differences to make an efficient and effective uh, mitigation program. That's all, thank you so much. Um, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hadria. <laughs> Very interesting background and presentation, but um, unfortunately, it was very limited time. <laughs> so thank you for the conclusion. And it's already 10 minutes, so, uh, there is no question and answer, or maybe you can have uh, more discussion in the box, or you can share what uh, everybody here can share the WhatsApp if you want to discuss more about the presentation, each other. But uh, thank you once again for Mr. Hardian Maulana. Yeah, you're welcome, uh, Nadia. Yeah, okay. So almost at the bottom of the list. Uh, now we we still have three uh, participants and then uh, 
because we have already uh, run of time. Arnis Roma Harani, uh, and I'm from uh, Architecture Department in uh, Universitas Indonesia. Uh, I can uh, present my paper with the title is the existence of a shortcut as an urban uh, space system to support physical and mental health. Okay, uh, discussion of a uh, healthy environment is increasingly uh, developed, usually focused on specific health outcomes, environmental feature, population group, and timing. The development uh, of the level of vocability in urban space belief could improve physical uh, health for the community. Discourse more the description of healthy urban environment that can support the health of its citizen. We argue, that seeing for a different perspective of micro level, how everyday life occurs in urban environment uh, can be developed to support macro health urban design. Shortcut are understood uh, as a form of uh, connectivity between place and mostly used by pedestrian. Uh, this picture is a shortcut uh, that's I mean uh, this, this one. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Ford state that uh, shortcut are ideal place for informal activities that can help create a sense of community. Okay, uh, and this paper uh, will explore the urban environment uh, that can support health where it has long been uh, recognized as a major determinant of health. This paper investigates the existence of a shortcut to broaden of uh, understanding a healthy city in the context of everyday life in a uh, kampung uh, environment uh, in Semarang, Indonesia. In particular, uh, this paper investigates the role of shortcut as a system in urban space to support the creation of healthy city. The discussion will be defined uh, into three parts. Uh, uh, the potential for shortcut more than from the connectivity between place, and the second, uh, to what extent the relationship that occur between user and environment in urban area can have an impact on the health of user, and the third, a uh, sense of security, intimacy, and belonging that affected mental health for the local community. The study discuss uh, daily practice that occur on shortcut to support health and environment. A shortcut in Kampung Bustaman is unique urban environment where collective activities are interrelated with uh, the area, not only as a connectivity uh, between place. The focus on this study in Kampung Bustaman in Semarang City, uh, based on the consideration that daily practice that occur in this environment have a distinctive uh, character. Observation technique to reveal the relationship between the user and the shortcut environment in Semarang were carried out using drawing and photography techniques. Uh, observation and interview like highlight that the daily activity that occurred within the shortcut affect uh, the perception of the people passing through it. The width of the route has a big role in the relationship between uh, human and environment. The Lecor group proposed urban route as a system of connectivity between place, the concept of a uh, radiant city. He argued that by widening uh, the, the route, uh, the connectivity between one place to another could be easy access by by fifty house. However, if we took uh, at the existing percept perception of a uh, shortcut in this uh, city space, 
in Bustaman, uh, the narrow route would have a uh, impact on human relation and increase intimate environment. The daily activities uh, that spill over into shortcut area are due to the lack of space in the inside of the house. This is a form of expansion of the interior area as relevant at, at, at Modi Wirjo uh, 2015. The phenomena in Bustaman Kampung show that shortcut low inhibitants carry out their daily activities collectively. Cooking activity that commonly located at the back house kitchen move to the outside terrace and become part of uh, the shortcut environment. The daily activity that occurs in a shortcut as an urban environment vary widely and are influenced by various factors that can lead uh, to certain perception. The feeling of an even existing as condition that can be felt visually, mentally, and sensitively. User relationship and uh, environmental condition can be explained and experienced through sensory encounter and social interaction where both intangible and tangible aspect of the environment uh, can be influenced. As that uh, by Smith et al., uh, the agency plays an important role in the formation of territory so that ownership space depends on the agency. In this paper, it is defined as a form from perception that arises for uh, gesture. The feeling of being in his own area that appears to the user of the room due to the atmosphere created uh, in the shortcut environment will give a feeling of calm. Like when uh, he is in on territory, uh, there is a feeling of waiting uh, to uh, nurture, pose, and comfortable. Uh, this can be seen from the occurrence of domestic activity, which eventually improves shortcut user. The environmental system that lives in it makes human actively uh, involved in their environment. This warm, close, and intimate feeling then gives the user a feeling of security. The assumption Hello? of shortcut as place to come. Miss Harani. Yeah. Yeah, you have two more minutes left, yeah? Okay, okay, okay. What happened is the process of security session in shortcut that arise due to daily activities and the relationship between humor and their uh, environment. The security, the security session system in urban environment arise from the relationship between user and environment, where user uh, perceive that the environment provides a sense of security. This feeling of security then form a feeling of protection and comfort when engaging in activity or moving environment. The sense of security that comes when crossing this shortcut certainly provides a positive perception of the user mind, which in turn creates peace for the user of space. This certainly support one of aspect uh, of urban health uh, by WHO, namely your urban space, which can provide pitch with a mechanism that lead uh, to health benefit, including providing a psychological relaxation. Uh, and the conclusion are uh, the shortcut can be seen as urban space system, apart from their basic function as urban connectivity. Uh, the daily practice that take place on shortcut can also stimulate the feeling of the occupant uh, that can be interpreted as an urban environmental system which support the creation of healthy city. And the last is daily practice that are few on a micro level uh, about what happens in everyday environment can provide a broad uh, discourse which in turn can be developed for macro purpose. Research can be investigated more deeply in the future research activities. Uh, okay, that's all. This is my presentation and thank you.
cek cek satu cek oke okay. Cek, cek, satu, cek.
Welcome, Welcome back to Inkrit 2020. Before we jump to the next session, we would like to ask all participants to fill the evaluation form given in the chat room. And the next event is closing statement and wording. For closing, for, for closing statement will be delivered by the head of environmental engineering department to Dr. Badru Zaman STMT, please welcome. Bismillah, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin. Thanks to Allah for successfully this event today without any serious problem. Salawat to Prophet Muhammad, his family, his sahaba, his umma, uh, include uh, for us uh, who's his follower. Thank you very much for all speakers that uh, knowledge sharing. Uh, thank you for all presenter, all participant, and especially thank you for all organizing committee who work very hard to succeed this event. Forgive us for any inconvenience along this event. We hope you can join again in third in Creed, inshallah, next year in Samarang uh, directly face to face uh, without uh, online. The last, don't be forget to always pray. And as soon as possible, this pandemic will end. So be healthy. Thank you very much uh, for you all. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Mr. Badrus, for the closing. All right, Donna, we will move to the most awaited session, which is the awarding session. We are going to announce the participant who got best paper and the best presenter. And here we go. The, the best, best paper, paper of Increase 2020, 2020 goes, goes to... And congratulations to Ganjar Samudro, STMT, as best presenter. Also, congratulations to Mrs. Ika Rohiatul Jannah as best presenter. 
Congratulations to Lia Pemulasari, SSI, as Best Presenter. Congratulations to Muhammad Padri, SSI, MS, as Best Presenter. And also, congratulations Ningsih Ika Pratiwi, ST, as Best Presenter. Congratulations to Sigit Kuniawan, ST, as Best Presenter. Wedo Aru Yuh. Yudan Toro, ST, as best presenter. And the certificate of the best presenter and best paper will be given by the chairman of INCRI 2020, please Dr. Haryono Setio Huboyo, STMT. for the moderators. So first of all, I will congratulate to all the presenters who have achieved for these uh, presenters, or I think that's nine presenters best papers. So I will give the certificates for the uh, best presenter as well as for the best papers. First of all is best paper for uh, Miss Pertiwi Andarani STM TM Ang. So uh, congratulations for you as the best presenter. And then the second certificate is for Andrian Satyadama PhD as a best presenter, uh, congratulations. And then the third is uh, Mr. Ganjar Samutro, STMD, as the best presenter, congratulations Mr. Ganjar for the uh, as your achievements. And the fourth is a certificate for Ika Roy Hatul Jana, as a best presenter, congratulations. This is the certificate. And then the certificate is for Lia Pamulasari, SSC, as best presenters. And then certificate to uh, Muhammad Padri, the uh, SSC MS for the best presenters. And for uh, certificate for Ningseh Ika Pratiwi, as a best presenters. And for uh, Mr. Sikit Kurniawan ST as the best presenters. And certificate last for uh, Mr. Wedo Aru Yudantoro ST as the best presenter. So this is the best presenter for each uh, room and the best paper for all of these uh, participants. Congratulations for all of these, uh, your achievement. Thank you. Wow, amazing. Congratulations once again. We hope this achievement will strive you more create new innovation for environment. Congratulations to the best paper and also the best presenter. We hope this achievement could increase your social role for the better environment. Now, we're coming to the end of the conference. It's been an exciting conference and enjoyable experience for each and every one of us. To close this conference, we have special quote for you. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. I am Nova Shafa. Dan I am Donatri Sukma. On, On behalf, behalf of, of all, all the committees, committees, we would like to say thanks to all the participants for your enthusiasm and participation. All participants may leave the Zoom meeting after we play the credits video. Stay safe and see, see you, you in, in the, the next, next Increase 2021. 2021. See ya!